calling to order the City Council study session, Monday, October 1st, 2018, 6.30 p.m. All council members uh, present, uh, six here, one, Christy. In the sky. In the sky. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. God. It's just a blood thinner. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Number one goal of the meeting is going to be to end early. Just to get that out early. <laughs> and going to topics and our number one topic. Madam Deputy Mayor, uh, members of the council, I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Thomas. And he's going to walk you through this issue. All right, uh, thank you, Mr. Interim City Manager. Good evening, Council. Jeff Thomas with Community Development. Joining me at the staff table is David Goodman, also with Community Development. Um, we have a, a short presentation for you this evening, so hopefully we'll do our part to getting you out of here early, Deputy Mayor. Um, uh, study session on one of our um, proposed comprehensive plan amendments for this year to process through and reach a decision on. Uh, this item was docketed last year in 2017 for this year, uh, one of several, and um, essentially um, it will amend our capital facilities element of our comprehensive plan to provide a permanent and dynamic reference to uh, the ongoing adopted capital facility plans of our school district partners here in the city, all three of them. With that, I'm actually going to turn it over to David to walk you through um, a short set of slides and then we'll be happy to take any questions you may have at the end of the presentation um, and a friendly reminder, we are scheduled to have a public hearing on this tomorrow evening. So this is your work session um, in advance of the public hearing. With that, David, take it away. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, good evening, council members. It's David Goodman with Community Development. Um, so as mentioned, uh, tonight I'm going to share a bit of background information with you about what school impact fees are and why we're interested in them, why we're interested in them here at the city. And then I'll go through some of the proposed changes uh, that we have to the capital facilities ele element that will hopefully make this process uh, much easier in years to come. Uh, so as you're likely aware, there's three school districts that operate uh, here in the city. The Lake Washington School District, which is to the north in the yellow on the map there. Issaquah School District, which is to the south in the blue. And then Snoqualmie Valley School District, which covers just a thin slice of uh, the city at its uh, northeast and southeast corners. Um, so every year, each of these school districts op, uh, adopts a six-year capital facilities plan. Uh, and this document uh, is the district's main facility planning document for the six-year period that it covers. Um, and essentially, it establishes the facility needs that the school districts are going to have over that six-year period. Uh, and in order to fund those uh, facility uh, plans, they also include in that uh, capital facilities plan a uh, school impact fee, which is levied on new single family and multifamily development and helps to pay for the additional space that is going to be required uh, in the district to accommodate the new development. Uh, so the schools derive their authority to collect the impact fees from the Growth Management Act, uh, and the fee generally changes uh, on an annual basis and takes into account variables such as construction costs, land acquisition costs, uh, and each district's what they call a student factor, which estimates how many students each new housing unit is going to generate for each elementary, middle, and high school that's assigned to that particular location. Um, so uh, to... Uh, and also because the schools uh, don't have a role in the development process, which is uh, the process by which those, uh, during which those uh, fees are levied, uh, cities are authorized by the Growth Management Act to collect those fees on the school's behalf and then uh, remit them to them on a regular basis. So uh, to give you a bit of context, uh, on the top there are the 2019 impact fee rates for the three school districts operating in Sammamish, uh, the both, both the single family and multifamily rates. Um, those will be coming to you later this year for uh, the council to adopt so that they'll be um, active for the 2019 year. Uh, and then on the bottom is a quick summary of how much in impact fees the city has collected on behalf of the schools, both in 2017 and year to date 2018. Uh, so if you go back, sorry, not oh, quite um, So any questions on uh, school impact fees before I get into the proposed amendments that we have? Sure. Councilmember Hornish. Why the so much difference between 
single multi between the school districts? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I th part of it is that, generally speaking, multifamily units do not just don't generate uh, students at the same rate that single family does. I realize it's a bit counterintuitive because uh, you would think that you know multifamily buildings uh, have a you know fit more people into a smaller area and therefore might uh, generate students at a higher rate. Um, but actually, as the numbers um, the numbers work out, they just generally um, don't. Uh, put as much additional pressure on the school district's facilities. So uh, I can't answer those specifically to each district. Um, later in the year when we adopt the school impact fees, we usually have representatives from the school districts attend and they'll probably be able to give you a more thorough answer than I can. But, but if you're interested, uh, each of the capital facilities plans that are not that long, they're about 30 pages, um, includes the calculation for how they end up at that figure. Okay. Any other, <coughs> Council Member Stewart? I was going to um, rephrase Councilmember Hornish's question to say, <coughs> can we get from the school district what their rationale is <coughs> to see if the the data actually backs that up? That possibly in Redmond, sorry, <coughs> where the there may be more uh, of the multifamily you know units that don't actually have students because there may be more businesses. Right, so I think the, the question really is, can we see the data that backs up that in the Lake Washington School District versus say the Issaquah School District, that multifamily uh, units produce yet less students, I think is really what we're after. And if you're saying that it's in the, the plans, then we can read through that. Otherwise, it might be a great question for us to follow up with the school districts to see that. Thanks. Um, quick interjection here on, I believe it's November 6th, uh, the council will have a public hearing on the um, the 2019 impact fees for these three school districts. And as David mentioned, we typically try, certainly with uh, Issaquah and Lake Washington, to have reps there um, for that annual event to answer your questions that you may have. Good questions. And Karen, can I say something? Karen, uh, council mm -hmm. member. Oh, <coughs> Chris. Sorry, I'm all choked up. Oh, <laughs> Mayor Melchow. Yeah, I was going to say, the, it, it, you can even go back and look at the 2018 impact fee rates because it actually breaks it down under the multifamily and, and single family residents um, by how many kids were actually turned out of each one of the neighborhoods that were constructed. So it gets pretty granular as far as the data, and I suspect we'll get all of that same data for 2019 as well. But I think either David or Jeff said it, we'll have the calculation on how they came to that number specifically. I think she said we have the data. Is that what she said? We do. So you're saying we have the data? It'll, and do they update that data annually? Because I know from working in the schools yes. over the last few weeks that I know those numbers have raised dramatically from last year to this year from those units. Yes, they're, they're updated annually. But this, this is what their 29, it says 2019 impact fee rate. So I'm assuming that this, these are what they're going to propose to council. Yes, so I just want to make two quick comments. The first is that the uh, Mayor Malcho is correct and that the, the impact fee rates on the top there have already been uh, adopted as part of the capital facilities plans. The school boards usually adopt those in May or June. Um, so those are essentially set in stone. Uh, the plans do include, uh, I think, a five-year historical look at how many uh, students all these different developments actually uh, end up sending to the district. So there is some data back up to it. Uh, and the other thing I'll mention is one of the, uh, I'll call it a challenge, one of the challenges of um, these impact fee rates is, you know, as you're aware, these three school districts go uh, serve multiple cities. So Issaquah School District, I think, serves three, at least three different cities. Lake Washington serves also at least three. I think Snoqualmie is similar. So um, they're not city specific, so they don't levy the fee differently to Sammamish versus Redmond versus Issaquah. Um, so what you're seeing also has some, uh, some of the inputs into that fee are not specific to the city. So that's something else to keep in mind uh, when considering these. Any other questions? 
So, uh, as I mentioned, the mechanism by which the city uh, can collect the school impact fees on behalf of the district is by incorporating those capital facilities plans into the capital facilities element of uh, the city's comprehensive plan. Uh, and because of the way that this element was written at the time of the past, uh, of the last uh, major update in 2015, uh, the city has been extra cautious and has adopted uh, a cap. Uh, an amendment to the comprehensive plan reflecting those new capital facilities plans every year because the way that it was written, it had some static references that referred to the 2014 capital facilities plans which were in effect at the time that this was adopted. So it's not entirely clear uh, that the comp plan reflects the latest version of those capital facilities plans. So the city, just to be extra cautious, has adopted a comprehensive plan amendment. Um, but that's actually not uh, required. The Growth Management Act simply requires that the capital facilities element uh, references the latest plan. So uh, the crux of our uh, proposal here is to replace all of those static references to past capital facilities plans. Uh, with what we call a dynamic reference, which will simply refer to the latest version of the capital facilities plan that has been uh, adopted in some way by the city council. And uh, by extension, the school impact fee will be then adopted as well. Uh, so I won't uh, read this entire thing, but this is just to give you a quick uh, two slide uh, summary of what we're proposing and what it's gonna look like. Um, so we're proposing to have a policy capital facilities 1.4 read that uh, incorporate by reference to the extent not inconsistent or in conflict with city plans or regulations, the following plans, and that includes all the capital facilities plans. Uh, and then here to say that the complete capital facilities plan, uh, this is in the background section, uh, the complete capital facilities plans of the three school districts as amended and adopted by council uh, are adopted by reference in this capital facilities plan element. Each district's complete capital facilities plan contains detailed information regarding school facility development and impact fees, including, and then it'll list some of the um, required elements of those uh, capital facilities plans. Um, so our goal is by making these amendments in the future, the council can simply adopt an ordinance that both uh, adopts the capital facilities plans as well as the school impact fees that are contained in them, and the comp plan will be left out of it uh, from, from here on. Uh, so I'm happy to take any questions on the content, uh, but just real quick, uh, we presented this at the Planning Commission on September 6th and received a recommendation. Uh, tonight we're here talking at the study session and then we have a public hearing tomorrow uh, on October 2nd. And then uh, as, as you're familiar with uh, from your work on some other comp plan amendments this year, uh, we can only amend the comp plan once per year. So what we're doing is working on multiple amendments to the comp plan, taking it right up to the finish line, uh, but not adopting it. And then in December, we're gonna adopt a complete package of multiple comp plan amendments so that we meet that requirement that we can only amend the comp plan once per year. Do we have any questions? Thank you for your presentation. Okay, thank you. Great. Next, we have Big Rock Park. And I'm going to call on Ms. Fesser to come up and uh, walk you through the plans for Big Rock Park. Site B. We go. All right. So, good evening, Deputy Mayor Moran, Council members, and members of the public. The Parks and Recreation staff is here tonight to present some background, an update of design development work, and requests for some direction from the Council regarding Big Rock Park B. We have relatively sizable amount of information to share this evening, and um, there will be opportunities for questions as we progress through the comprehensive presentation. So um, presenting tonight for the first time to City Council is Shelby Peralt, our Parks Project Manager. She will provide a bulk of the presentation and towards the end, I'll um, walk you through the, the five dis 
um, discussion points that we have for council's direction tonight. I also have with me tonight Anjali Meyer, deputy director. She's uh, here to provide additional information if needed. And we also have our consultant in the audience, um, Liz Gibson from KPG Senior Landscape Architect. So with that, I'll turn it over to Shelby. Perfect, thank you, Angie. Um, so like Angie mentioned, this evening I'm going to be presenting phase one improvements for Big Rock Park Site B. As a part of my presentation, I will provide a brief history of Big Rock Park and the Reared Freed House, and then go through phase one improvements and their associated project costs. And then lastly, we'll hand it over to Angie for the discussion component to receive your input on a number of components, such as the ADA ramp to the tree house, a new maintenance building, the Reared Freed House utility connections, and an allowance for necessary trail restoration work. So to begin with some background, in 2010, the city entered into a phase land donation agreement with Mary Piggott for the donation of three properties that are located in the heart of the city, totaling 51 acres. In 2011, Site A was transferred to the city and shortly thereafter began the master plan for Site A and B. Site C was not included in the master plan process because it is and will remain as such the private residence for Mary Piggott for the foreseeable future. In 2012, during the master plan, the Reared Freed House was relocated from its original location, which is just south of Ebright Creek Park, to Site B, and the master plan was adopted in 2014. In 2016, Site A construction was completed and opened to the public, and in 2017, Site B was transferred to the city, and this year, design development began for Site B. And as part of that design development, in May of this year, we had a pop-up sort of meeting at Site B for the neighbors surrounding the property, just to give them a recap of the master plan, what was included as part of phase one improvements, and go through their questions and concerns that they had. And so we mailed out 40 letters and had over 25 people attend the meeting. And to help orient you, let me just pull up the laser pointer. Um, so there's two access points into Site B, the primary being from the south on Southeast 20th through 216th and Southeast 16th into the southern part of the property. And the secondary exit uh, entrance is to the north from Southeast 8th Street through Lancaster Way and onto 221st. So next, giving some background on the Reared Freed House, the home was originally constructed in 1895. In 2001, the home was donated to the city, and this house is the first registered historic landmark in the city of Sammamish. In 2012, as I mentioned, the house was relocated to Site B, and shortly thereafter, the city authorized funds for the structural improvements and exterior painting to the home. <coughs> In 2014, we entered into a lease agreement with the Sammamish Heritage Society to complete the renovations for the Reared Freed House. And then as recently as this past June, we authorized funds for the exterior architectural drawings to the home, as well as uh, work for restoration to the fireplace. And to just give you some context, the photo to the top on the right-hand side is the house before it was relocated to Site B. And then the bottom photo is present day. So you can see there's been some significant renovations done to the home. And next to just give a brief overview of funding sources that the Reared Freed House has had. So the Heritage Society has received over 135,000 from the city for renovations, and then over 390,000 for from grants and private fundraising for a total of over 525,000. Um, and then the photo to the top is before the house was relocated. And then the kitchen wing that we recently authorized funds for those drawings is to the right. So this was demolished before the house was relocated to Big Rock Park. And then the bottom photo, fun action shot of the house during the move to Site B. So before moving forward with the master plan overview, let me just go back a second. I just wanted to stop to see if anybody had any questions related to some background on Big Rock Park or any questions for the Reared Freed House. No, okay, great. Yep. So, Can you go back a second? Sure. Uh, I'm looking at the little asterisk. You, you have the 123, 400 pending legislative approval? 
on right. the- Right, so that dollars amount is a grant that the Heritage Society had applied for and was approved preliminarily, but until the state uh, legislative budget is approved, they, they won't receive the funding until that's approved by the okay, state. Thank you. So it's pending. Okay, so moving on to the master plan portion. Uh, this may serve as a bit of a recap for some of you, but um, the master plan for Site B was broken out into two pieces, the woods and the south meadow. So the woods is located in the northern portion of the property and includes parking on 221st, environmental education and habitat enhancement, and trail improvements. And then the south meadow on the southern portion of the property has the primary entrance, the parking lot, the historic Rude Freed House and Heritage Gardens, the picnic shelter, and existing structures. Now the master plan broke out improvements to site B in two phases, and these um, the area of improvement is located within the red dashed. And as you can see for phase one, it's a very robust list of improvements to be executed. Uh, just to highlight some of those larger ticket items, those being right of way improvements, access into the park, parking, and utilities. And then the second phase of improvements takes place primarily in the northern portion of the property and focuses on um, construction of a picnic shelter, a bird blind for environmental education, trail improvements, and then stream and habitat restoration and enhancement. So as I mentioned with the overview of the master plan, phase one is a very robust list of components. And so it became evident that several of these needed some additional research before moving into design development. So staff put together a small contract with a consultant to review a number of components, um, such as ADA access to the treehouse, right-of-way roadway requirements, investigating the septic field to be reused for new restrooms, investigating the on-site well to be used for irrigation, looking at the detached garage to be remodeled for park storage, determining utility connections to the reared freed house in the kitchen wing, completing a preliminary traffic analysis and then conceptual connectivity to Site C. And as part of this initial phase, there were a number of preliminary studies that needed to be completed. So I'll give you just a minute to look through those before moving forward. So through this feasibility stage, there were a number of components that I mentioned previously that have been resolved, and now we are ready to move forward um, with a design contract. Our consultant has prepared a preliminary design. Um, it's important to note that from this feasibility stage, there are a number of similarities and differences between the preliminary design and the master plan. Uh, so to note those similarities, the primary entrance into the park will remain on 220th, there will still be a vehicular one-way driveway in the South Meadow, a parking lot for 12 parking spaces, heritage gardens with the historic Root Freed House, restrooms, and maintenance storage. Differences to highlight are the ADA ramp to the treehouse, the demolition of existing structures, trail restoration for park access, and utility connections to the Reared Freed House. Um, before moving forward into the preliminary design components, I'd like to stop here and ask if anybody has any questions that I can answer based uh, on the feasibility component. Councilmember Ritchie. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned uh, one-way driveway. Is that, where am I not seeing that on the map here? On, uh, so people can drive through the park? Or so, oh, sorry. Go ahead, please. Oh, okay, so the one-way driveway is for when you enter into the park. It's almost like a roundabout type oh. configuration. So there's only one-way traffic. People aren't going multiple directions. Gotcha. I just I was looking further in the yeah. park. Like we're gonna have people drive through the park. That's yeah. You know, <laughs> thank you. That's perfect. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I've got a quick question. Mayor Malchow. 
Um, are we going to get into the ADA ramp to the treehouse and whether there were multiple, um, I guess, ramps looked at or configurations of the ramp or not? Yes, uh, later on in the presentation, will we be going into further detail about the ADA ramp? Very good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so moving forward into the components of the preliminary design for phase one. Uh, this is the same list that I showed you earlier from uh, elements that were included in phase one development. Again, a very robust list, highlighting some of those larger ticket items, being right-of-way improvements, access into the park, parking, and utility connections. And as I mentioned for, um, as well, um, trails were included in the northern portion of the property in phase two. They're not in phase one. Um, however, we do recognize that with neighbors around our property, there are some trails along the perimeter that will need to be decommissioned, but also we need to maintain a trail loop and then access between site A and site B. Additionally, there is a uh, existing crossing that's not up to code that needs to be replaced as well. This work should be done prior to the park opening to the public to allow for trail access to the north of the property. Councilmember Valdemar, do you have a question? Yeah, I have a question as far as the programmed requirements for parking. What do you entail to do in parking uh, to change from where it is now? And is there any change to the number of parking spaces that have? No, the parking is staying to 12 spaces in the parking lot within the park and then to three spaces to the north on 221st, which is within the number in the master plan. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so moving to the north to 221st, uh, this will serve as a secondary access point into the park. It will be a pedestrian access only and it will include three parallel parking spaces within the right of way. Um, parking to the north will help to alleviate some of the congestion of parking within the park um, and also allows for a secondary access for our neighbors to the north. And then the photos to the right are existing conditions of 221st. And then moving to the south, um, 220th Avenue will serve as the primary access point into the park, and it needs to be upgraded in order to accommodate public use. Uh, the entry to the park is at the dead end of a residential street and runs in between two single family residences. One, um, which requires access to their home in this section of the right of way, which is indicated in the red circle dash. Um, and currently we're working with those neighbors to determine their future access to their home and we'll also need to complete private property restoration in this phase. Can I, can I clarify the primary access to site B? Sure. Just, uh, just, just for those listening, it, it's a primary access until site C comes online at some point in the undefined future, correct? Correct, yes, the site B, this will serve as the primary access until site C does come under city ownership. We do foresee site C being the primary access as it is along Southeast 20th Street. Perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so moving into the park, um, the parking, um, parking lot will include par 12 parking spaces. Uh, the one-way driveway is uh, outlined with a red dash for vehicular traffic, and there will also be accessible trails in between the buildings. So as part of this initial stage, we reviewed the feasibility of keeping existing structures on, on site. So we looked at the detached garage um, and completed a structural assessment to determine whether or not it could be reused, but unfortunately, this structure is at the end of its life. There are significant costs for repairs, and these will only add five to 10 years to the life of the structure. So we are proposing to demolish and replace with a new maintenance building that has a similar footprint. Council Member Stewart. Yeah, I'm sorry, I just had a question about the parking spaces. I know that um, this is intended as a temporary, but could be years, that it's temporary. How did we come to the calculation that we would only need 15 parking spaces? Right, so it's three to the north and 12 to the south. 
or is that just all that the property can handle? Uh, that is correct. So it's more to do with, uh, you know, through the master plan, there was significant concern from the neighbors to the south that, um, you know, we would be um, growing the use to this park significantly. And so this is definitely intended as a phased improvement. So all the improvements in the park, we would program it so we would have limited uh, use. So it's based on what the park can handle and the access can handle. Because to the north, there seems like there'd be plenty of room to add parking spaces on the park property, and that would be closer to uh, Site A, right, where you uh, enter Site A. So I was just curious why we didn't look at, or did we look at adding more spaces uh, for the access to the north? When you say access to the north of Parcel B or to the north of the whole park? So uh, on the north end of Parcel B... Right. Right. Um, I mean, if I'm understanding correctly, you drive you to drive past the access to Parcel A, right? Today right. to get to that access point for Parcel B. So, I was just right. curious if we yeah. considered adding more parking there uh, is, up there. Right. There is a uh, you know a small amount of grade drop at that location. It is not ideal to hold a lot of parking. Okay. So it was only offered up as relieving congestion for the neighbors from the north. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so moving from the detached garage to the Tanner House. Um, this home was built in 1930 and is built on cedar log foundations. Uh, it was always identified during the master plan that this building would likely be demolished. And lastly, for the sauna and laundry room, uh, the master plan identified that this building would be repurposed for restrooms and park storage. However, um, there are significant costs for retrofitting this existing structure, and staff have determined that a prefabricated restroom is a more appropriate long-term solution. Next, moving to the Reared Freed House. I already talked a little bit about the history, but to give you an idea of what the inside of the home will look like, uh, the first floor will include two rooms, the first being for a heritage museum, and the second will serve as public meeting space. The second floor will have a private restroom, office space, and storage for the Heritage Society. Councilmember Valderrama? I actually have a question on the previous slide. Uh, first of all, when the Reed House was going to be moved, it was moved to that parcel in part of the logic of moving it there. If you go to the, path, the earlier slide, was because of the Tanner House, and they were supposed to be of similar circa and taking place. Now we're going to demolish the Tanner House, because I guess the foundation is what I understand is a problem that will not be able to be sustained, uh, even though that was part of the reasoning that we had moved it over there. So I guess I wish there was a way to save the Tanner House, given that was the rationale for that taking place. The second part is, if we're going to demolish the Tanner House, has there been any thought of using that with Eastside Fire and Rescue as we did with the Kettering House over here where they can then do an actual live exercise with our public safety forces? So just to put that on the agenda, if that's the way it has to go. Thank you. So um, spoke a little towards the second floor and what that would look like. Um, one other thing to note is that the kitchen wing, which is the white dashed outlined area adjacent to the Reared Freed House, this is what the footprint of that kitchen wing will look like. Um, the Some of this work was not anticipated or foreseen during the master plan, so these improvements were not included in the project scope. Uh, just north of the Reared Freed House are the Heritage Gardens. Um, this will be similar to an early 1900s landscape design with asymmetrical planting, winding pathways, and a minimal use of lawn. And currently we are um, exploring an opportunity to partner with a local organization for the design, planting, and maintenance of these gardens. Uh, 
Uh, moving north of the reared freed house is the prefabricated restroom. Um, this will be installed where the Tanner house was located and will connect to a new septic field and include two unisex restroom stalls. Uh, the new maintenance building will uh, replace the existing garage and will be a similar footprint to that existing garage. So I don't know, I know that some of you didn't have the opportunity to visit the treehouse before our meeting, so I wanted to include some photos just so you could get some perspective. Um, the treehouse to be built by Mary Piggott was identified in the master plan for Site B. And as you can see, it's a very significant treehouse. It's built into three cedar trees. It in, is connected with a tension bridge, a boardwalk, and includes a bunkhouse and a large gathering room. Now, the treehouse was built prior to the parcel being donated to the city. So the city is therefore not required to make this amenity accessible. Currently, it's only accessed via stairs, but the city has an opportunity to make this amenity universally accessible by removing the stairs and replacing with an ADA ramp. So the first image in the center is a rendering of the ramp connection to the treehouse and shows its connection to the surrounding trail network. And the second is uh, the same connection, but showing you the square foot uh, footprint of the treehouse. And then the image to the top is an illustration of what that ramp connection would look like. Now, if council elects to move forward with an ADA ramp, there are a number of modifications that need to make that need to take place in order to make it accessible. Um, an example of this is with the low-hanging branches on the image to the bottom right. Uh, these branches would need to be removed in order to make it accessible. Aside from the ramp, um, we are proposing a ground level path that is noted in this light brown color that weaves um, in between and around the trees that provides a secondary experience with the treehouse. And tonight, we are also seeking input on the programming opportunities for the treehouse, and Angie will be speaking to that a little bit later on in the presentation. So the final... Yes, so the Mayor Melchow. Thank you. Um, so on the ADA ramp, I, I think I alluded to this earlier, I was just curious if there were other options that were explored as far as access to the treehouse, and then I want to understand if we put in an ADA ramp here, I am, I've, I've been up to the treehouse directly across from where these branches are shown that would have to be removed. There is that, there, I believe there's one of those tension bridges, and that obviously would not be ADA accessible, correct? So the only portion of the treehouse by way of the ramp would be the very that very front section. Is that right? Correct. The portion that has a large gathering room and the boardwalk would be the only portion that are, would be accessible. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. Sure. I think she also asked about, um, oh. she also asked what other options were explored for the ramp, I believe. Mm -hmm. I did. Yeah. <clears throat> During the design process, um, we worked with the consultant uh, to to take a, a, you know different views or concepts of how to approach the treehouse and what would be the best uh, route. And this was the solution that um, had kind of the least amount of impact to the treehouse per se, still added to the experience. Um, the architecture of the ramp will match the architecture of the treehouse, so it looks like a component that was uh, originally brought in with the treehouse. Um, this moves, it uses the topography for the least amount of ramp also mm -hmm. and uh, the best approach. So as we mentioned earlier, we have the suspension kind of bridge and connection on the west edge so you wouldn't bring the ramp up into that part of the treehouse. So this brings it up into the most accessible, the room and platform at this area without being obtrusive and I, again using the existing topography to make the shortest ramp pop possible. Great. So moving on to the oh. fine. Oh, sorry. Hold on, we've got a question. Um, Councilmember Hornish. One, you said it, but I missed it. Why are we not obligated to 
commit to the ADA? Right, so we had WCIA do a site visit with us, and they said because the structure had been built before it became under the ownership of the city, and it's kind of a unique amenity that we're not required or because to, it was, to we, we took retrofit it. After it, was built. it. Okay. So this is more of a choice, actually, okay. yeah. Any other questions before moving on? Any other questions? Okay, thank you. <coughs> so the final selection of components are utilities. Um, so looking at the well, the septic, utilities to the reared freed house, and stormwater regulations. So the well was intended to be used for irrigation, um, but as of now, both site A and B are considered to be one project. Um, so. Site A also has a well, and the threshold for supplying irrigation is not sufficient to supply irrigation to both Site A and Site B. So Site B's well will be decommissioned, and we will connect to Sammamish Plateau water for irrigation water. Uh, for septic, uh, the septic was reviewed by our septic consultant to be reused and upgraded for the new restrooms, but unfortunately, um, King County has determined that a new septic field needs to be installed to meet current codes. And then for the utility connections to the reared freed house, as I mentioned earlier, um, these associated costs were not anticipated during the master plan process, um, so they were not included originally. And then for stormwater regulations, so since the master plan has been adopted in 2014, our stormwater regulations have changed. Um, they are more stringent and um, they have a significant cost implication for this project as well. So now that I've walked you through all the different components of the preliminary design, um, I'm now going to provide a breakdown of the anticipated project costs. So, um, the project costs are broken down between those that are required and those that are optional. Those that are required are necessary in order to open the park to the public. So I have broken out some of those costs that you could see costs for contingencies, um, right-of-way improvements, and uh, soft costs. And then the optional costs are broken out by amenity. And that dollar number for the amenity is inclusive of all soft costs, taxes, and contingencies. So if council elects to move forward with all of these optional amenities, the project costs will be just over $3.83 million. Currently, the budget for phase one improvements is $2.2 million. Um, however, there- I'm sorry, can you repeat that again? The current budget for phase one improvements is $2.2 million. Um, there are sufficient funds within the park CIP to fund this project. Um, and so we can open this for a few questions, and then Angie is going to go into further detail to receive your input on whether or not to move forward with these optional amenities. Okay, first we have Council Member Stewart, followed by Council Member Hornish. And yeah. Council Member Valderrama. Great. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about the, the trails? Because um, I'd like to know more about um, how we might be able to make uh, both site B and, and possibly in the future the other sites more accessible uh, by means other than cars. Because for instance, right now, site A is really only accessible via car, right? All the roads leading to site A uh, have no shoulders or no um, uh, sidewalks. So it's not really safe to approach Big Rock Park, at least not from, uh, from the front side, if you will, uh, anyway, but via car. So I'm just curious what kind of trails uh, the plans have and will that open it up to getting people there without having to get in their cars? Okay. So the um, trails identified here in the optional component are just the trails on site B. We are not addressing um, trails per se outside of any of the parcels. The right-of-way improvements on 220th do include a sidewalk, um, which um, we, we don't have anywhere else in that neighborhood, but we are providing safe passage into the site from the south with cars coming into the park, and we figure if people are coming on foot, they'll be safe on the sidewalk there. So um, the the... Trail restoration here, I'll talk about a little bit more when we kind of get into each one of these items to discuss a little more in depth. So, does that answer your question though? Okay. 
my turn. Mm -hmm. um, the 2.2 in budget is over how many years versus the 3.8 over how many years? Is it one year budget or two years, three years project? Right. So you want to talk about the timing? Yeah. Um, so there is 2.2 uh, in the 2018 2019 budget. Um, and then the 3.83. So right now, what we are anticipating is for construction to take place in 2020. So design going from um, starting now and then ending in winter of 2019. So it's um, a year extended past um, what was originally. So it's in the new biennium. You're talking instead of 2.2, we if we approve everything, it'd be 3.8 in the budget that's upcoming here in the next few months that we're going to be approving. Right. Okay. Through 19 and 20. <laughs> Correct. And that's the design and everything. Okay, that's helpful. So it's basically over two years for a project. Right. That's what I want to understand. Okay. The uh, septic. I, I assume you did this, but I'm just curious. The cost benefit of that versus sewer, because you're getting you're bringing water in anyhow. Um, you probably know more about this than I do. I, I just yes. don't. <laughs> so sewer isn't actually available until you get south to southeast 20th. Okay. So, so it's I, okay. beyond Okay, that answers my question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was just curious. And then finally, the last question I had is the maintenance building and, and the garage mm -hmm. that's there right now. Mm -hmm. The concept I, I'm envisioning is for the new maintenance building is to, to house the mowers, the equipment for that land. If you don't have that maintenance building, what are you going to do? We will trailer and haul. <clears throat> so part of part of this maintenance is is contracted services, but this maintenance building is more about storage and support for that site, um, and supporting the activities there because the tree house will not have storage, the reared freed house has very limited storage, the restroom has no storage. So we would use it kind of both as storage for activities related to the site. Um, but also support maintenance activities too, that if we had special projects website. going there. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. And thank you for putting this plan together. I'm, I'm trying to understand the 2.2 that's been budgeted. In parcel A, when they did the master plan, as I recall, the master plan for parcel A was $4.2 million, the completed master plan. And maintenance, well, we'll start with the 4.2. Is any of this 2.2 associated with that 4.2 from the parcel A? Or is this completely separate? I don't recall the overall cost of Yeah, I, I can take a look at that really quickly. We can look that up real quick. Um, we do have, um, in, in the meantime, I'm going to stall by answering your question on maintenance. Um, we do currently maintain the site at approximately $20,000 a year. We, we mow, we maintain the trails, we keep those um, manageable, although it's One not- One is 30,000, A or B? B, site B alone right now is maintained at $20,000 a year. Even though it's not open to the public, we still maintain it. Um, we did a cost estimate of with all these improvements on the site, and it's about $44,000 a year we're estimating for maintenance of parcel B with all the improvements we have listed here. Because it, it concerns me if we have 4.2 on the first, 3.8 on this one, and we still haven't gotten C, uh, at least in parcel A when we were under the discussions here, they were estimating that if it was fully built out parcel A, that we would be looking at 400,000 for the maintenance on that. Uh, but that included everything going up on this one. This one you're estimating it's $45,000 maintenance coming right. on. And then C, obviously we would have the house to maintain. Those are significant costs, especially when you add into it, uh, A, that you're taking all of these off the tax rolls, so we're no longer getting tax money into it. And Mary Piggott used to say that she spent more money maintaining the property than she paid for the taxes. Uh, onto it, and I love the park. I love uh, Parcel A. In fact, I was just looking back and uh, recognizing I spent my birthday on Saturday with my boys on the Big Rock Park. So I enjoy it, but I am concerned of what this implies for the coffers of the city, especially with uh, C still coming onto us, and how much we're going to be be looking at. Additionally, on this parcel. And we've talked about it when you talked about going through that residential street. One of the things that we've promised those neighbors, there's the Grassos, the Wilsons, the Chambers, et cetera, was that we would not bring a lot of traffic through that parcel. 
uh, and so they'll be looking at $3.8 million when we've been telling them that we're not going to be bringing a lot of them. I think we have to be looking and selective in how we're going to uh, comply with that agreement with them and at the same time how much we put in. I, I love the heritage gardens. I think that's something that won't uh, be doing. And obviously we have the reared house already there and that's not going to be bringing. Uh, but that is a consideration that we've got to be looking at and I'm trying to figure out how you spend $3.8 million and then still say, but we're not going to bring many people into this area. Uh, so I'm trying to get my head around that uh, between the two. All right. Thank you. Well, if I may address a little bit about um, the attendance of the park and the use of the park, um, knowing that C will eventually come online at some point and that's where a majority of the access will come from. We can control some of the access through programming of the site. Um, the treehouse, obviously, if you've been in it, you'll understand, will have quite a draw because it's very, very unique. We can um, take a look at programming that and deciding how we want to offer that treehouse to the public. That would probably contain some of the, the number of visitors to the park as well as programming of the reared freed house. So you can look at this as kind of, you know, site B coming online, um, minimal programming, minimal activity, and then once C comes online, um, change the program in B for larger attendance, but have the people access that through parcel C instead. So we do have some kind of levers we can kind of use to, to work on that and, and honor the agreement we made with the neighboring um, residents about um, kind of keeping the traffic down and the access into the site. Well, if we're gonna do minimal programming, then I think you do minimal investment as well. It was is how I come from, in my perspective, rather than, uh, I mean, we're known for gold plating everything. I mean, there are letters to the editor on that and, and to spend 3.8 million and say, well, we're not gonna drive much through here to program it. I'm just trying to wrap my head around that uh, to go around it. That's, I, I'm uncomfortable with that. Thank you. Karen, if there aren't any more lights on, I have mine on for all intents and purposes. <laughs> okay, Mayor Melchow. So I have a few questions. Um, I wanna go back to the maintenance building. Um, there's a building that we have on site A. Is, is there not room for storage there? Yeah, ex oh. excellent question. There is a pole barn structure, but it is open on two sides and um, would require extensive retrofitting to close in that structure and use that. That could be an option if but the council wanted us to explore that, we could take a look at that. Um, we will have access between A and B. Um, we're gonna open that up. We have some easements on both sides of the point over those two properties meet, so that will open up and be accessible. So we could explore that further if the council desires. I'd be interested to see what that looks like cost-wise. If it's less than $245,000 and we're having to maintain site A, I don't see any reason why you wouldn't be able to move equipment between site A, site B, and then you know potentially site C when that comes online. Um, the second, um, I do, I, I wanna go back to what council member um, Valderrama was just talking about, which is um, you know, the, the large investment we'd be making in, in this amazing parcel that we were really, truly blessed to be uh, uh, given um, by Mary Piggott. Um, but I, I know that the neighbors in that neighborhood are concerned about traffic. And while I think some of that may be offset by the use, being able to move from site A over to site B via the trails, um, I do wanna ask about the optional allowance for necessary trail restoration. Because, um, Angie, I think you said that we are doing some of that currently. And then early in the presentation, they talked about decommissioning some of the trails. But I don't see that here as a, as a cost embedded in, in all of this. Is that parked inside that $252,000 for restoration? Or is that separate? I don't see that anywhere. Right. So actually, if we can move on to uh, the next couple slides, we'll get into each one of these. We're going to detail them out a little bit more, but we'll we'll jump to the fourth one here on the list. These are four discussion points we're asking for direction from the council on tonight. We'll kind of jump to number four here, the trail restoration. And this is um, extending the existing kind of minimal maintenance level that we have right now. That's basically clearing limbs and making sure the trails are not deteriorating. 
However, there's a pretty extensive trail network on the northern half of this property, and um, about a third of those trails run very close to the outside property lines and neighboring property. And we want to decommission yep. those trails so that we can provide some privacy to the neighbors. In addition, there's some kind of duplication of trails um, in there that we want to eliminate and decommission, which also decreases maintenance as well. What's important on this, however, is if we are gonna to try to encourage access from the northern side from parcel A and from 222nd, at least creating a um, kind of backbone trail system or network into the southern part of the site would be beneficial. We feel that it's also cost effective to do this work while we're on site, right? That uh, we mobilize once, we do this work and kind of do this all at one time. So there's some cost effectiveness, uh, effectiveness of doing it during this project, so. Okay, and then I've got one last um, thought more than um, question relative to the impacts to the neighbors um, and minimal parking on site for site B, which is the possibility that we could hold on opening the tree house altogether until site C comes on online for us, which will provide the adequate parking that we need that won't impact the neighborhood. And if the tree house is not open for either programming or the public, and uh, you know, I'm not necessarily advocating this, I'm just kind of throwing it out as a thought. I mean, the tree house is really cool and it is going to attract a ton of people. I think it's gonna be very difficult to try and tamper down that excitement about it seeing it. Um, and so that could be something we might consider too. Absolutely. Um, so with that, if we can kind of maybe shift in, we're kind of already dabbling into these four topics here, but maybe we'll just kind of go through them. We wanted uh, requesting direction from the council tonight on each one of these components. If you wanted these included in the project moving forward, moving forward means design development, right? Taking what we have now from this preliminary plan and turning that all the way into construction documents down the road. but. We want some direction from council tonight if you want to proceed on these as or not. So the first one again, the tree house and the accessibility of the tree house not required, but is optional. One option on this would also be to consider not installing the ramp until parcel C is open. So putting this one on hold is a little bit easier than some of the other work in that um, it's a pretty much standalone project if that makes any sense. So. Um, we would just like to hear some input from council on this. Okay, now we do have lots of questions. Okay, so we're gonna start with council member Stewart <laughs> going go. then Light to council up. member <laughs> Ross and then um, to council member Vondel Rama. Sure, um, so a couple of council members have uh, brought up concerns over the 3.8 million, but if I really look at the numbers, right, the, the bulk of that uh, is not on these four discussion points. Uh, the bulk of it comes from uh, the master plan and, and other aspects. So um, I guess the question is, what um, of that 1.4 million for the master plan, uh, I know there's a master plan in here, but what does that 1.4 million cover at this point in time? I'm assuming that, and maybe it's a bad assumption, maybe I need to be educated, let's put it that way, on uh, what of the master plan has already been executed and what's left to be executed and what does that 1.4 million represent? Because we really are talking about, you know, concerns over a total dollar amount, mm -hmm. these, items right here only add up to just under 700K, so that's not the bulk of that number. Right, um, and do you wanna go back to the slide that shows the, the required versus the optional as well? So what, so what we provided here is yep. basically minimum requirement to open the park, right? and that's in that top piece. So I, I'm understanding your question is, what's included in the 1.4? Well, or even, I mean, again, if the concern is 3.8, I think that the the four items you have, again, represent less than a quarter, they're actually less than a fifth of the total cost. So if that's your concern, then we really need to be talking about the required elements, not the optional elements, exactly. because the optional elements are a very small percentage of this cost. Right. So... When you, yeah, so to look at it that way, 3.1 to basically open yep, the park. Exactly. And so those were all the elements that we talked about during the mm -hmm. presentation. Right. The, the right-of-way improvements, bringing 
people into the park, that's a half a million dollars right. to do that. The circular drive, the parking, yep. the um, heritage garden, the changes to the buildings, the restroom. Um, and that's all part of that 1.4? Correct. Okay, all that's the what I wanted utilities, to understand. Okay. the infrastructure, basically what was included in the, in the master plan. Got it, okay. Work. Thank you, because I think that's really, to your, uh, to the pr prior council members' questions, I think that's more, more uh, relevant, so thanks. Council Member Ross and then Council Member Valderrama. Thank you. You mentioned the ADA is independent project but how about the other elements? Can each of the other three be done independently or sure. if you don't you do them at the same time, the it's gonna cost you bit? more? Right, so um, the maintenance building could be a standalone, although there's some, some utilities that uh, would, we would run to that, that we'd probably conduit anyway and set up for that. The reared freed house utility connections, that's a little trickier because that involves a lot of underground utilities coming in. And if you're gonna bring in a water main and water line, you might also tee it off to the house while you're there rather than tearing up sidewalks and parking lot and, and um, structures above ground on that. So that one is a little harder to do a standalone. Um, the trail restoration is an example of standalone. Yeah, I mean, we can open the park without the trail restoration and make it work. So does that, does that answer? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, I guess I'm, if we're talking about site A is what's gonna be driving more improvements and programming to this. I don't know why we can't delay First of all, the right-of-way improvements, because the right-of-way improvements we've been saying, it's not gonna be utilizing much traffic initially. So that to me doesn't seem to be an initial urgent mandatory to open it up. I've, I've parked there, I've met you all over there. It's uh, regularly taking place. I'm also curious to know if we can postpone the biggest item here is the 1.4 million for the master plan. Uh, base cost because if you're going to be doing site C planning, if that can be assumed in part of site C planning and have a significant reduction in price here, I, I, I guess I keep going back. We paid 4.2 million on site A, the idea of 3.8, and then site C having Mary Piggott's house is just an astronomical amount of money for putting in what was always meant to be an environmental passive park, and it seems to be outgrowing what the original designs and intents and pocketbooks uh, were looking at the same time coming off. So I would like to see if you can come back and tell us, hey, can we do planning for site C and B together? What would be the savings of doing that? Why can we can't delay the right of way improvements? Why we can't delay a number of, of, of the options and have a standalone passive park to begin? and strip out all the gold plate and what's the minimum to go and let's leverage site A planning, which is gonna be, to be honest, in my opinion, it's gonna be more expensive to do that planning and organization and what we're gonna do with that facility than this and come back to us. Right, so the first point that you brought up, the right of way improvements are actually are required to open the park. So Steve and uh, Jeff there in the back won't allow us to open the park without those improvements. That's part of developing the park, is that those are considered right away street improvements. So those- Unless we do it as opening it with parts, parcel A, and uh, of course, and then we're waiting for, I'm um, saying C, sorry, C. Uh, Correct. Wait. Correct, if we chose on. to use C as the primary access for the entire Big Rock Park, then yep. correct, we would not have to do the right away improvements at that site. Um, I, I do, I do wanna kinda go back over some numbers about parcel A, if I may. Uh, the improvements to parcel A were about $600,000 to open that park and, and to result in the condition or the, the amenities that exist there now. I believe our maintenance on that park is close to $40,000 a year. The 4.2 in the master plan was actually encompassed both A and B. So, B. Correct. Okay, so that was my original question, how much of that was incorporated in here? 
Right. So the, the master plan amenities that you see in B are driven from the master plan. I mean, the amenities, we haven't um, uh, deferred or, or um, deviated much from the master plan. We are very respectful of the master plan and, and have just refined the elements of the master plan for parcel B. So, so this 1.4 is part of that 4.2? Yes. Correct. Is that what I'm hearing? So we haven't uh, paid down to, and again, going back, if we look at doing the master planning with site C, mm -hmm. what would be the savings or potential savings? Um, that is hard to say because master, or master C, <laughs> this <laughs> master plan for site B, C has not been done. We have not determined what we will do with C. C has a great amount of potential. It has a, a residence on it that so can stay yeah. or leave um, or be demolished. It has a barn. It has big flat open areas um, and it has a, a wetland. Um, so that will require some extensive master planning, but we do know that it's a far better parcel for uh, accommodating large sums of people, right, to access the entire parcels A, B, and C. So, so we do knew that, know that. The, the design that we refined on this is keeping that connection in mind at the very southern element or um, southern end of parcel B. So we are thinking about C. However, um, we have no indication of when Mary will donate the parcel. Could be five years, 10 years, 20 years, we don't know. And after the donation, it'll take several years to master plan and then another probably two or three years after that to construct. So we do have some timing issues with C. So this is, this is a, not an easy uh, call to make. It's not clear and you know, cut and dry. There are a lot of moving parts to this project. So Anjali. I just wanted to add that, you know, we would always need ADA access to the Riyadh Freed House. So they, even if Parcel C came on board today, we would still need to make the right-of-way improvements on to 20th to provide ADA parking to the Riyadh Freed House and potentially the tree house. So as a base minimum to open it, we would just need the right-of-way if we work on the, the master planning with, with C? Right, and then I, I may... I'm not sure we are following you correctly. When we say master plan base cost, that's for the actual uh, construction, not the planning, but the construction of the uh, driveway, the parking. Oh, that would be included as parts of that. Correct. So and the term is a little confusing the way we've used it, but it's actually to execute on what the master plan envisioned is what we were trying to say in that. Okay, then uh, Council Member Hornish and then Council Member Ritchie. Okay, I'm gonna try to answer your questions on the four items. <laughs> I am not for the ADA ramp since we don't have to do it. I am not for the maintenance building. I'd like to look at the other option you said to investigate on parcel A. I am not for the trail restoration at this point. On the Assuming for a second that we go forward with the, the minimum, the 3.132 million, mm -hmm. assuming that, I wanna come back to that in a second, but assuming that, I would be for the, the, the reared free house utility connections to your point, because it's like, you don't wanna come back and have to do that again, so. But having made that assumption, I think that's the real issue you're kinda of hearing. We're already a million dollars over what we have budgeted. 2.2 .2 to 3.1 is, I'm gonna call it a million dollars mm -hmm. for 2018-19. I remember on parcel A, I remember sitting back in that corner before I was sitting up here, the estimates were about half of what the actual costs were. How comfortable are you on this 1.4 million? So we have refined this considerably since the 2.2. So the 2.2 were cost estimates based on the master plan. But since then, we've done all these studies that resulted in a lot of information about things that are not structurally sound, a septic system that we can't use, a well we have to decommission. We've, we flushed out a lot of those concepts and ideas. I'm certainly much more confident with this 3.1 or 3.8 um, cost estimate moving forward. That being said, there are some other issues that we're dealing with. The cost of construction right now is increasing with things like tariffs and prevailing wage. Uh, we have for landscape laborers going from $17 an hour to $37 an hour. 
the, that is deals with construction as well. And we have, that just came into play and we have to tighten our numbers on that. But that's also why we have larger contingency numbers, right? If you can back that slide up. The, the looser the design, the larger the contingency number. So as we re refine our design and move forward, that contingency number will be tighter as will our cost estimates be tighter. Fair enough, which kind of tells me that we're better, but we're still not real comfortable with it. And I think what the real question is coming to me is, and maybe the question we should be asking ourselves as council, do we really want to commit this much money, this budget, at this point in time, or should we delay the opening of parcel B? Because exactly. if we don't commit the 3.1, you're saying we can't open it, so that's the real issue. Do we want to open parcel B or not? Right. I also want to remind the council there's one more big step in here. So what we're here for tonight is asking permission to move forward on this design, these components and amenities here, moving forward through um, construction documents. Then we come back to you one more time before we go into construction, and that's when those numbers will be really tight. So we're basically asking- Have bids at that time? I'm sorry? Will you have bids? You won't have bids. Oh yes, you absolutely, will. a will. bid process, All right. absolutely. So it's not like tonight you make a decision and you turn us loose and then we're at the ribbon cutting, right? That there are a couple of steps involved here where this is just giving us permission to move forward flushing out all the design elements into construction documents, and then we come back to council again before we go out to bid. So there's another checkpoint in here before wait, wait, we go wait, into wait, construction. Wait, wait, you said out to bid. I thought you would have bids when you come back next time. I'm sorry, uh -huh. no, yeah. we, we, we will go out to bid for that's the construction. So the, and yes. that's where the cost went up two to one for parcel A versus the estimate, and when the bids came back, it was two X. Right. But we have the ability at that point to, to stop the project, and I think, right, or not go along I with it. I think we went forward with it, though, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah okay. A, you yeah. did. Um, but you, like I said, as the council, you have a choice at that point to say, well, we're going to table this until maybe the construction environment is better. Okay. Yeah, okay. But your design is done at that point. Gotcha. So. Council Member Ritchie. Uh, okay. Oh, sorry. Karen, just put me on the list for questions. Yes. You're actually right after Council Member Ritchie. Thank you, I'll be quick. Um, more to Councilmember Hornish's point about trying to give you some direction from each of us. Um, I build ramps for a living and an ADA uh, ramp in that location is absolutely appropriate. Um, there's no other way to access it. Um, it is universal design at its best and it could be built to blend to the, uh, to the architecture, to the landscape. I think it's completely appropriate. I think that absolutely should be included from this council member's perspective. Um, the reared freed house utility connections, it's an amenity, it's an attraction, just like the tree house. We want to drive people to come to these, to the amenities so that people actually use the park and use the amenities and creating access and creating a utility so we have lights and water and everything, that makes sense, right? Um, the trail restoration, again, it's an amenity. People like to walk around, whether they wanna to go to the tree house, or they wanna to go to the reared freed, or they wanna just walk around. Trail restoration and decommissioning some trails completely makes sense to me. The only thing that I think I personally would think that is negotiable is the, the opportunity to trailer some things in um, and that maintenance building might be something we could mm -hmm. to see. I mean, I, I don't wanna say it's too much. Uh, I don't, I'm not, I think we, those of us that were on the doors last fall heard a lot about we need more parks. We are here to, we live in this community to be able to be outside and enjoy things. So this is an incredible opportunity that Mary Piggott has given the city, it's, it's a once in a, I don't even know, I mean, it, it's incredible. And I think that to to sell it short, to, I, I'm not, I, I don't think this is gold plating anything from my perspective, I think this is creating access, it's creating utility, and it's creating an opportunity to use and enjoy. So I, the only thing that stands out to me is something that could be taken out would be the maintenance building because you have resources. Now having said that, uh, I mean, the maintenance operation folks are full up at their other facilities, right? So we need to find another place to store those things. So this might be a good place to utilize that. So I'm, I'm kind of thinking yes to all four, but I'm also cognizant of budget and want to make sure we're utilizing the space well. So that might be something we could put in later. Um, but I, I still think that those three items, the ramp, I would never want to deny anybody, your legal obligations aside, I would never want to deny anyone the opportunity to utilize that beautiful tree house. I would never want to stop the use of the reared freed because it's, 
it's, it's a historic landmark. What are we not going to have lights and water? I mean, come on, you know, we got to have the access to it. So I, and the trails, that's why people go to the parks. That's why I go. That's why my family goes is to be able to walk around and have the trails be, you know, usable, accessible, clean trails. Um, I, so I, I support all four with a little bit of a little asterisk next to the maintenance building for a chance to come back. So thank you for your work. I appreciate it. And thank you, Mary. Yeah. Mayor Melch. Up, Karen? Thank you. Um, Angie, under optional, you have allowance for necessary trail restoration, but on a later slide, you say that these trail restorations are necessary in order to open the park. So that doesn't sound like it's an optional thing. It sounds like it's required. Is that fair or not? No, so there's two ways to look at this. The the allowance for necessary trail restoration is on the northern half of the of the property. So we have within the design the, where the, the turnaround driveway is and the parking and the trails between um, the reared freed house and the restroom and the tree house, those will go in. Those are part of the basic master plan base cost. The, the 252,000 okay. we're asking for is mostly related to the northern half of the property and getting those trails up to our level of service. Okay. Um, and then in an attempt to answer some of your your questions here, I think um, as much as I want to access this parcel, um, I, I've had the opportunity on, on a couple of occasions to go and get on some of these trails and it, it's truly a, a huge gem for us. I am, I have a little bit of heartburn over the dollars associated with this, especially over the budget. And I'm in consideration of road projects that we have, which um, are, in my opinion, taking priority over um, the addition of site B. I'm wondering if we maybe table this until we know exactly where we're sitting on that front. Did you catch that last part? Yeah. Did you, 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 did, you did catch it or did not? Could you please repeat? Uh, the last portion yeah. of what you said. I, yeah, so I, I, I have some heartburn over the cost associated with this, considering that we're well over the original 2.2 million that was budgeted for this project. I understand that, you know, there are things that were unforeseen um, here, but um, I just think as far as priorities go, my priorities currently for this city are on our roads, and I suspect we may need that $3.8 million um, for our roads over parcel B, especially if we can tie it together with site C and uh, decrease or at least minimize the impact to the immediate, immediate neighborhood there. Okay, do you have any other questions, Chris? Uh, Mayor Melchow, sorry. <laughs> it's informal tonight. Nope, that was it. Okay, all right, then um, we're going back up to Okay, we're going back round two. Okay, uh, we've got Councilmember Valderrama followed by Councilmember Stewart. Uh, thank you. The reared house, uh, first of all, if you ask me on the optionals, uh, all of these are optionals that can be brought back. So if we say not ADA now or the others, they can be done later. Uh, the reared house itself right now isn't ready to go. Uh, we're gonna now have the kitchen that's going to be added, correct, that under the grant that's going to be coming on. How long will that process take? Yes, that's a pretty extensive uh, process it, contingent on the, the 123,000 actually will not build the kitchen addition. It will uh, be used towards improvements inside the existing structure right now. But when the kitchen improvements are being done, you're not going to be showing me that's a small facility. Correct. So, right. So it'll be so we're really not looking at bringing that on anyways. Uh, so given that that's not even going to really be ready or imminent, given the price tag that we're being shown at this point and the budget issues that we're now starting to look at, and given, as you said, we're going to minimize programming till site A is running because that's what we also promised the neighbors out there to be that we're going to minimize the number of traffic when we're driving through there as you have my hand, i'm not comfortable going forward with this project at this time and opening up that parcel until we have all of that resolved and an understanding of the budget and where we are with it uh, frankly that's where i'm at council member stewart 
Yeah, sorry, I have uh, some questions. Um, one, do we have a current estimate on the construction inflation rate right now? So like what's the cost of delaying is kind of my... Steve, do you guys, yeah, it varies every day. Um, but I mean, just a ballpark, I mean. Yeah, I'd say five, right now 5% is kind of the round number that we've been using. So 5% a year. Yep. Mm -hmm. So a delay of two years, three years is 10, 15%. Okay. Um, and then the other question I have is, do we have some estimates on the number of visitors to Parcel A? So we know how many people, um, in terms of trying to understand the priority of this, how many people uh, currently use Parcel A and, and trying to understand, I mean, I go, to, I go there not a lot, but I drive by there a lot. Uh, there are always people at Parcel A, but I just don't have a sense of the numbers there. We do not have a, a okay. participant count. How about, um, I know you did a survey, how many people uh, visit our parks annually? I know we have that number. I don't know if you have that off the top of your head. I do not have the top of my head, but I'm really, more you than don't have that I know, memorized? I know, oh right? My gosh. Um, but I'm more than happy to, do, we can pull this information and definitely share yeah. it with the council tomorrow or the next day. So yeah, I'd just like to get to a, an estimate. I mean, mm -hmm. again, as we look at priorities, sure. if, you know, the better part of our population is visiting our parks annually, then maybe this is, right. in fact, a priority. Um, in terms of the maintenance building, I know when I visited uh, the maintenance and operations centers, one of the points that was uh, brought up was that because we have limited facilities, the maintenance crews uh, have to be, um, they have to be really precise in the times that they're moving around because they don't want to, one, add to any of our traffic issues, and two, they don't really want to spend an hour sitting in traffic driving things around, um, you know, from here and there. So do we have a sense of, um, and again, you, you know, you can go and gather this, but how much we'd really save or versus spend in terms of building a maintenance facility? And I don't know. I mean, it, it's just an interesting cost-benefit analysis of if we put a maintenance facility on a particular location in five years, it pays itself back because we're not spent, we're not paying people to drive, you know, uh, 30 minutes across town or something like that. Um, and uh, and then. Um, I think that was it. So those are, I mean, uh, to your questions here, I would say that if we're going to move forward with the project, the optional pieces, uh, again, are uh, a fairly small cost in the total. So I would be supportive of the optional components. Again, uh, the ADA ramp, uh, it kind of breaks my heart to have to remove those uh, low limbs because they're pretty cool. But uh, the thought of denying, you know, especially if we did programming for, for schools, the thought of denying school children uh, to be able to go up in there because we didn't make it ADA compliant, I just think would be, um, that would just make me sad. And I think that that wouldn't be uh, okay with me. So I'd be supportive of these optional, especially the trails too, because again, I think that uh, on, par on parcel A, that's a huge part of what people use. I know my dogs love to walk through the trail. So um, I would think that, and again, to uh, reduce the impacts on the neighbors, right, to be able to give those buffers to maintain those trails. Uh, and if I heard you correctly, that doing this investment in the trails will ha actually help reduce the maintenance costs annually. So it's a 252000 cost initially, but it may uh, start to have some payback over time because we'll, we're going to reduce some of the redundancy. So um, I would definitely be supportive of all four of these optional components. Thanks. Okay. Next, I have Council Member Hornish, and then followed by Council Member Ross. I have a follow-up to Mayor Malchow's question about priorities in my understanding of the budget. We have a Parks and Rec budget. We can't really take money from there and use it on roads, can we? Correct. Some of the funding sources in the park CIP is designated absolutely towards parks. So REIT is a good example of that. Park levy monies that we have, those are very specific to parks and cannot be used for so other So do we know capital. how much of this, if we decided none of it right now, that we could reallocate? It's a budget question, I'm sorry. Is right. <laughs> no, and, and, but that's a question that we can spend some time kind of exploring. Okay. Um, look at our revenue sources, what's earmarked. Um, our park impact fees, obviously a big source of our revenue the for the parks, capital, yeah. must be for increasing capacity only. So that can't go out into streets right, or any right. other program. So a majority of our revenue sources for the CIP is earmarked um, specifically for, for parks. parks. So yeah. 
if we didn't spend it on this project, it would still stay in the park CIP. I, I'd like to see an analysis of that and a better understanding of what is our parks and rec budget versus the overall budget mm -hmm. and versus the 2.2 .2 versus the 3.1 that we're now looking at as far as comparison, yeah. uh, if we could. Does that make sense? Yeah, an analysis of the numbers and, and yeah, what's funding that, where does yeah, that sit within could. the park yeah. CIP yeah. overall? Okay. Right, yeah. Karen, I, I've got a question following up on that question just uh, for her. You were mentioning about the impact fees that can only go for capacity. I thought that the state legislator allowed a percentage to be utilized for maintenance of parks as well that that was something that they were trying for a couple of years that actually Don Jaron had been pushing to make sure that we utilized uh, some of that. Isn't, can't we use part of that for maintenance of parks? I don't remember I, if it was like 25%. I'll research that, but I don't believe at the time that the city designates that as okay. for some of that as maintenance. I believe it's only capital improvements mm -hmm. at this time. Steve, Steve might be able to answer a question. <laughs> Steve. Or we could Thank call you. Don Jaron. <laughs> uh, good evening, Mayor Council. Or, uh, Steve Lanchesky, Public Works. Yes. So TIF or PIF, no, but your operational considerations can be used from REIT a little bit. There is a proportion of the REIT transfer that can go for operations okay. in lieu of capital, but, but not the park impact fees. But we haven't done it. It can go, but we haven't. Or? I don't believe the city's done operations. No, <clears throat> not yet. It. Okay. No, that's what it was. REIT can do that, but right. not, not park impact fees. Right. And park impact fees are a bulk of our revenue, actually. But we'll, we'll do some uh, analysis and share with the council on that. Those are good questions. It's good for budget process anyway. Council Member Ross, I also want to remind council that we have been on this topic for an hour. It is five to eight. <laughs> Mind your time. Well said. <laughs> okay, I'll follow up on the REIT um, path first. What, what percentage of the REIT do we allocate to the parks, refresh my memory? I believe it's uh, it's half of REIT, so it's 2%, 2.5% 2 that we collect. 50%. No. Come on. Steve, why don't you stay up there? <laughs> He's getting lost. Steve and Angie show. So I believe we split REIT here between streets and parks. Yes, right. re being ill-prepared, there are two REITs. There's REIT 1 and REIT 2. One of the REITs, they are both, uh, the total is a half, so it's each a quarter percent of sales from property. So REIT 1 and REIT 2, but one of those REITs is predicated, it cannot use... One of them you can't buy park land with, one of them you can. Right. So that might be the only thing where we subtly okay. need to check. And I think we split the, the deposit to parks and streets about 50-50. Yep. Okay, and is that by ordinance that we change that percentage if we were to redirect funds to streets? I believe so. I don't know if it's ordinance or resolution. But resolution. Yeah, yeah but, it, but it has to, yeah, it has yeah. a legislative process to it. Yeah. Okay, and, and the second part is regarding the 100 $23,000 grant. Is there, once we, uh, assuming everything goes well and the legislature passes their budget, gets it approved, we get the money or allocated to us, how long do we have to build or use those funds before they expire or get taken away from us if they can? Right. So first, I want to clarify that those grant funds were secured by the Heritage Society, not by the city. So, and they're, they're a nonprofit separate from us. It's a two-year cycle. They usually have, I think, four years to start to use the funds, but they can get um, extensions on that if they're making progress with the work. So four or six years usually is kind of the range for that those expenditures to be made. The, the Heritage Society can make those expenditures as soon as they get the money. They're ready to do that. Okay. Mayor Melchow, do you have any questions? Nope, I'm good. Okay, then I'd have two comments that I'd like to add. And one is, could we just get a cost of putting sides on the pole barn, regardless of what we do? So if we decided we were just going to use it as a maintenance facility on that site, that we had that cost just separately. And then the other one is, could we also get um, what the cost would be of um, as we start adding things like we start, I see trails and all these things. I look long term wise of what the maintenance of that those costs are going to be. So mm -hmm. when we start putting up these parks and and um, and when we started, we were going to have them as passive parks. We're turning them more into parks that were going to require a lot of maintenance. And I'd like to see what the long term cost of those would be. 
Right, so we, we did do an, an original estimate based on the improvements we proposed here, and that was about $44,000 a year. We're currently spending $20,000 a year for parcel B right now to maintain it as is and not open to the public. So it, it would increase that about $24,000 with these amenities in place. So, but those obviously will increase a little bit every year, plus we should look at some capital reserve funds as well, so. Okay, do you have anything else that you need to have from us at this time? No, I, we are gonna come back. We've got a couple couple little more slides for next steps on here, but um, we will be back in front of you on November 6th with a contract to move forward with the design development, getting into construction documents. So that will be your opportunity to basically vote as a, as a group to say yes or no to move forward on this project. Okay. So we'll formalize that, but if Shelby wants to Take it home and wrap it up. That'd yes, great. Shelby, it was yeah. nice to see you in front of the council. Thank you. <laughs> um, so just to close the loop, um, if council does move forward with a design contract, um, design, construction documents, and permitting will take us through winter 2019 with a council award for a construction contract and bidding being done in spring of 2020, and then construction taking place from spring to late fall of 2020. Um, so with that, I'd just like to thank you for taking the time to answer our questions and listen through the great amount of information on Big Rock Park. <laughs> and if you have any closing questions, feel free to let us know. Thank you, excellent presentation. Oh, thank you. Five minute recess. Okay, okay we're gonna call the meeting back to order. Meeting, it's actually a work session. All right, let's do this. Roadway capacity and level of service. All right, well, good evening, Deputy Mayor, Council, City Manager, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Steve Lanaszewski, Public Works. Uh, tonight, Kendra Breland and Cheryl Paston are here to discuss the policy-related items remaining to be selected for the V to C capacity ratio analysis. Uh, the screen will be a little off from your packet. They added some information today, so we'll go over that. Not, a, not any drastic changes, but just a little bit of clarity as we march through the questions. We do have questions that we are hoping to get answers from. We do feel at the end, we're not gonna be able to answer everything because we will have to go run some numbers and come back. So the big question on what is our V to C ratios and whatnot, that will obviously need to see the results before we get to picking 1.0, 1.5, whatever we get to. So with that said, I will let us uh, be entertained by Cheryl and Kendra as we go forth for the rest of the evening. <laughs> well, we'll see how many laughs we get. Um, <laughs> one, two. <laughs> All right, so thanks, Steve. The purpose tonight is to discuss the key policies that we need uh, your direction in order to complete the analysis that Steve just briefly mentioned. We have four methods. Actually, there's three methods, but one has kind of two variations. Uh, these are methods to calculate the roadway segment capacities, and then we have a sample of some uh, capacities in V over C results. We were able to run, uh, Kendra was able to run them uh, last week, so we'll show those. You've seen this a, a version of this policy decision tree. I updated it given, given the direction that we received uh, a couple of meetings ago. And I'll kind of briefly go over them right now. Kendra will, will talk you through one of the examples of the numbers in the table, and then we'll revisit this, this flow chart again to get your, your uh, direction. So the first, there are about seven, uh, policy questions and decisions that we need from council. You have weighed in on two of them, the time period and the direction. Uh, but the first one is which roads do you want to include in this uh, analysis? Either the principal and minor arterials only. We could go with the 2015 comp plan, but we would have to add Issaquah Fall City Road. Or we could go with the draft 2017 comp plan list of segments. The next decision is, does the council want to just use segments or do you also want to use corridors? Again, corridors are made up of, of contiguous segments. The choices there 
are either, again, what was defined in the 2015 comp plan with Issaquah Falls City or what was presented as part of the 2017 draft uh, plan. And I, I don't recall off the top of my head how many segments we added in 2017. And then the time period, this is one of the, <clears throat> excuse me, this is the one of the policies that the council has weighed in on. And uh, you directed staff to go with AM and PM peak hours. The other option though is uh, average weekday daily traffic Tuesday through Thursday. I, I suppose you could, you could go AWDT Monday through Friday as well. Um, the next decision is which direction you want two way. Can I answer, ask a quick question? Sure. The AM PM is the, is that the peak of Monday through Friday or Tuesday through Thursday? It, that's Tuesday through Thursday. Did we not give guidance to use Monday through Friday or did we choose Tuesday through Thursday? You you the council had given us direction Tuesday through Thursday. Okay. And then. So on, on the directional, it's either two-way or one-way. And the key point on that one was that the council felt like the, they wanted to really evaluate the peaking uh, characteristics of some of the roadways, which is why we went to the, to the one-way. And I believe, Council Member Ross, that was your question earlier today. And then the method, again, there are four methods that, that Kendra will, will walk you through. Again, table T8, technically it's one method, is this kind of a, a modified table T8. And then we'll go on to the capacity. What is the council's pleasure as far as what capacity is acceptable in, in whatever roadways you decide to evaluate? And then, of course, the LOS threshold. So we'll walk through that at the end of, of the technical presentation and uh, get your feedback and direction uh, if, if you're able to give that to us tonight. With that, I will hand it off to Kendra and she'll uh, cover the rest of the material in your packet. Okay, good evening, Council. Uh, Kendra Braylon, Farron Piers, uh, consultant to the city. Um, so as Cheryl mentioned, there are four kind of uh, methods that we've come to you tonight um, to present. Um, three of them we've talked to you at length about, and then one is actually new tonight. So just in terms of the three that we've already covered, uh, table T8, which is um, the method that was used in your 2015 comprehensive plan. I think council's fairly familiar with it. Again, it's a, a daily methodology, uh, considers the volume to capacity ratio on the roadway, which includes not only um, veh vehicular metrics like the number of lanes, um, the width of those lanes, but also the presence of turn lanes, um, but also non-vehicular capacity metrics like presence of sidewalks, uh, bike lanes, shoulders, trails. Um, second method that we're bringing up is actually a modified version of Table T8. It essentially takes um, Table T8 and it strips out all of those non-motorized uh, capacity metrics. Um, so that was a, a question that had been asked by council is, you know, kind of how would that operate if we took out kind of those non-vehicular capacity elements and we'll present on that tonight. Um, and then the other that we've presented at length um, to council is actually the fourth metric on your sheet there, uh, the Florida Department of Transportation generalized planning approach. Um, we've brought kind of the FDOT methods um, to council in the past couple of meetings and talked about how those might work um, specific to 244th, um, but we'll talk talk about that tonight uh, with a greater kind of number of segments in the city. And then last but not least, um, we did actually um, dig up some generalized um, daily volume methodology through uh, the Highway Capacity Manual's newest edition, the sixth edition, um, and we'll talk about that as well. Um, uh, the pro definitely of this, this methodology is that it is the newest guidance from the Highway Capacity uh, Manual. Um, on the con side, as you'll see in the next couple of slides, it's not as well tied to uh, unique characteristics of individual roadways and communities. So um, just wanted to provide a quick uh, comparison of the key features of these four approaches. Um, so just wanted to kind of go through some of these. First of all, um, if you were interested in looking at daily volumes and, and kind of assessing your system's capacity based on kind of daily volume to capacity methodologies, similar to how the 2015 comprehensive plan evaluates segment methodologies today, um, 
all of these methodologies provide you with some guidance to do so. However, if you're interested in looking at just the peak hour, so just during 7 to 8 p.m. hour or a.m. hour or um, 4 to 5 p.m. or the 5 to 6 p.m. hour, um, uh, really the table T8, because it's based on kind of a daily volume to capacity ratio, doesn't provide guidance there. Um, neither would uh, this kind of modified table T8 approach. So if you're interested in going forward with more of a peak hour focus, um, we'd really kind of narrow our focus to the highway capacity manual or the FDOT methodologies. Um, if you're interested in looking at directional methodologies, Again, both HCM and FDOT do provide a mechanism for doing that. Um, if you're interested in considering non-motorized uh, capacity, so how does the capacity of um, the bike lanes, the trails, um, influence the person movement moving capacity, I'd say actually T8. Uh, your current methodology in the 2015 comprehensive plan is probably the preferable method for that. Um, and then last but not least, if you're interested in using a, um, a segment evaluation methodology um, that considers roadway characteristics, um, we've included in there on this table kind of the roadway uh, characteristics that are considered by each of these methodologies. As you can see, table T8 and FDOT probably look at the most things. Um, Modified t table T8 just, again, strips away those non-motorized ca uh, characteristics, uh, capacity uh, considerations that were included in table T8. And then the highway capacity math, uh, manual um, is a very, very generalized approach. Um, again, tied to the newest HCM methodologies, but considers the fewest characteristics um, on your roadway system. So uh, to give you a sense of how these four methodologies might um, work, uh, we looked at nine segments throughout the city. Um, so you can see on um, this map here kind of the, the segments that we looked at. Uh, just generally there were three on the north end of East Lake Sammamish Parkway. Um, we had um, a couple on the north end of Sahali Way and then three in kind of central Sammamish on 228th and then um, a last segment that we looked at on Isqua Pine Lake Road. So presenting now um, kind of our um, just kind of the numbers, we ran them, we use these methodologies, what did we find? Um, so just net orienting you to the tables that you're looking at here. Again, you know, going from left to right on the table, you can see the nine segments that I mentioned earlier. This is looking at daily volumes. Um, so because we're looking at daily kind of segment um, uh, uh, performance, we're able to use all four of the methodologies uh, that I mentioned earlier. Um, so you can see, again, moving from left to right, you've got the segment volume, the segment ID and the segment name and description of where it is. You've got um, the daily volume. Um, so again, that's Tuesday through Thursday, kind of one, one day kind of averaged out of that. Um, and then what the capacity um, is estimated by each of these methodologies. So again, what these methodologies are doing is given kind of the roadway characteristics that they take into account, um, they come up with their own unique estimate of how many daily vehicles they feel like is the carrying capacity of each of these roadway segments. So um, looking, for example, on ELSP, that first segment there, um, kind of from city limits to 96th Avenue, we've got about 19,000 daily vehicles um, that traverse um, that segment of roadway. Um, if you're using table T8, um, we've estimated the volume or the, the, the carrying capacity of that roadway to be tw about 24,000. Um, when we strip away those non-motorized characteristics, um, modified table T8 would actually estimate the carrying capacity of that roadway to be about 14,000. Um, if we were to use the highway capacity manual, its assessment of that roadway's character, carrying characteristic, carrying capacity, excuse me, on a daily basis would be about 16,000. And FDOT's 
um, assessment of that roadway segment's character, uh, carrying capacity would about, be about 11,000. Um, so you can see at the very right-hand side of that table uh, what the volume to capacity findings reportings would be if we were using each of those methodologies. And again, we're not we're not here to say what VC is appropriate within Sammamish, that's completely within your purview. Um, but this is informative to know, well, you know, uh, table T8 really didn't see that segment to be getting very close to its capacity. But when we strip away those non-motorized characteristics, actually that roadway segment is potentially quite a bit above what we would assume to be its daily carrying capacity. Um, and then as you can see, FDOT and HCM also have their own unique take. Um, so you can look across um, those nine segments um, and see how the methodologies vary in terms of their um, interpretation of how um, those roadways are able to carry daily volumes. I'm not going to dive in as deep on the next few slides, but um, we've done a similar assessment for the PM peak hour. Um, so again, orienting yourself to this table, we have those same nine segments. We have actually the PM peak hour volume that's, that's carried along there. And as you can see, table T8 and modified table T8 don't provide any guidance here um, because they're based on uh, day, daily segments. Um, but both HCM and FDOT provide some mechanism for <coughs> comparing um, the daily volumes to the assumed carrying capacity. And then we did a similar approach for the PM peak hour by direction. Again, looking at breaking up each of these segments to look at the northbound and the southbound approaches individually by their volumes with um, the assumed carrying capacity of each of these segments. Kendra, we have a question up here. Absolutely. From, if I remember Richie. If I could just jump in really quick though, we do had a, have a correction. Oh, yes. On segment two in the peak hour volume, uh, the the volume column we had had a mathematical error. I think it showed 990 some 995. So what you're seeing here in the screen is correct. 1781 uh, uh, traffic counts for that segment. So just to just to highlight that. Quick question. Um, can you go back to the previous slide, please? So I'm trying to understand. Daily volumes. So I need help to try to understand this. I'm not a traffic engineer. When I see a volume of 19,068 on East Lake Sammamish to the city limits and table T8 would uh, capacity V over C, right? Volume over capacity. So if I'm seeing 19,000 over 24,330, that essentially means it's passing. Under, so the way that table T8 is interpreted in your 2015 comp plan, is it says that a VC of less than one is passing, yes. a VC of over one is failing. Okay, so this is failing. With that standard of one. With that standard point of one. One, yes. It's passing. It's passing. It's point for table T8, it's passing. Because so it's point seven eight. Okay, so let me, that's, let, me, let me, that's what I'm trying to understand. If we go on to the modified table T8 and HCM and F dot. So if we look at this, I'm just looking at East Lake Sandwich, the city limits, just that number one. Table T8 shows it's passing. If we use modified T8, HCM or F dot, it's failing. Is that accurate? Uh, that is assuming that you've picked a, a VC of one. So just to give an analogy here, um, each of these methodologies are essentially sizing the cup and making an assumption about how much water you can hold. Mm -hmm. um, the water is the amount of vehicles we have in Sammamish. So um, under table T8, my, my cup is 78% full, um, but if I choose from the modified table T8 cup, my, my cup is overflowing by 32% is a way to think about that. Now, again, these are very generalized, sure. especially when you're talking about a daily, it's, it's making a lot of assumptions cooked in there. 
I get that. I, what I'm trying to understand is it, that helps me to understand. So when we talk about, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, R, you know, all those different things, this is another way for us to utilize. We could set it at two. We could set it at whatever we wanted to Boy. to avoid a road failing if we chose to. Or we could, right now you have it set at one because that's what our comp plan says from 2015. So based on our 2015 capacity, we're showing failures if we utilize T8, HCM, and F dot, if we utilize one as the standard. That is correct. And that's the decision we get to make as far as setting those, those numerical values as to what constitutes a failure. That is correct, and the one piece of context I'll provide you is that um, there are a number of communities that don't use a VC of one as their standard. Um, there's a number of communities that have used 1.1, 1.2, a recognition, particularly when it's a peak hour number, that they, they recognize that there are going to be times of the day that they're not going to build to accommodate. So this is daily volumes as a whole, and we have previously asked or previously focused on going back to your one of your original slides talking about we were focusing on AM PM peak. Correct. So can you forward one slide, please? Okay. So because T eight and modified T eight don't have peaks, HCM and F dot do, this shows one point two, one point seven six with F dot mm -hmm. at PM peaks. So, okay, I'll just leave it. I mean, that, that's instructive to me. That helps me understand what the value of a V over C calculation would be um, that, frankly, I didn't previously know. So thank you. Councilmember Valderrama. Uh, two questions. First one, we're showing the volumes and the peaks here on Utah East Community uh, Parkway, but I thought earlier we had said that we're not going to be looking or caring about the capacity on uh, East Lake Sammamish Parkway. So this is just for illustrative purposes that you're doing this, not that, uh, so to your point, East Lake Sammamish Parkway is off as far as the actual. I'm curious about the Sahali Way ones where we're under the highway capacity manual and the uh, Florida model. Are those the same intersections that we have nine intersections that are failing? You're off, you're off. Oh. Sorry. So, okay, illustrative purposes for the uh, for the East Lake Sammamish Parkway on the Sahali Way one, where it does count. Uh, one of the things I was curious are those segments coincide with the failures on the intersections, or that we had done those nine intersections that failed out of the forty-three. We have looked at them. Again, I would stress that these are in some ways apples to oranges in some ways because the the peak hour is looking at, you know, the, the peak hour at then, specific understand. intersections I'm just versus at the how segments. Those align or don't align for Sahali. We found overall some level of alignment. Cheryl's Cheryl's nodding because she had actually done this analysis. There was one uh, intersection on the Sahali segment that had, that was failing. Can you bring the, the mic closer? I'm sorry. There was one uh, intersection that is failing in those Sahali segments. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Then we go to Councilmember Hornish, then Councilmember Ross. <clears throat> yeah. I want to clarify what was just said. Um, I think we at one point exempted East Lake Sammamish Parkway from an analysis, but that doesn't mean that we can exempt it from a concurrency system if we have a concurrency system. Now, to clarify that, I mean, is that right? I mean, we clarified the clarification back from uh, two, three, four meetings ago that you cannot exempt and, and disregard an arterial under the GMA, correct? That is correct, and we do have we aren't exempting it right now because there are intersections. Well, that's on, what I was going to go and, and to make that ELSP, distinction so uh, to Councilmember Valderrama's point. I guess if we wanted to, we could say it's not exempt because we're using the intersection. Uh, and to his point, we could disregard the V over C for those road segments. Is, is that the distinction I want to clarify in my mind? 
That's correct. You do not need to include ELSP segments. You don't need to include any segments actually in your concurrency program because you do have the intersections on all of our arterials plus additional okay. Okay, uh, fair roadways. Okay, any more questions? Move. Oh. Sorry, I didn't get it finished. Um, do we know the answer to the question that can we have a different, and I don't know if we need to answer this tonight, and we certainly don't need to establish what our VOC policy level is, to your point, but do we know if we can set different VOC thresholds for failure at different, for different segments? We can. You can. Glad to hear that. You, yes. The Thank council you. can do right. whatever it chooses. All right. Okay. That's it. Moving on. So we'll return to the flow chart. Uh, and if the council is able to provide us some direction to narrow down which road segments you'd like the analysis to be done, that would help us a lot. Uh, so the first one, what, what staff is recommending, uh, that we go with the principal and minor arterials only. But again, it's, it's, it's completely, at the discretion of the council. Council Member Hornish. To answer your question, I, I got you. Um, you had kind of, uh, Kendra, you had kind of described the HCM model as generalized numbers that you got out of the HCM. Mm -hmm. It's been a while since I read the HCM, but my recollection was that it had specifics in there that you could actually calculate for each road versus using a generalized table. Am I, do I just misremember that? I, there are more specifics when you're going to a speed-based metric, um, but when you're talking about a volume-based metric, essentially we had a table um, that was provided as attachment C um, within your packet, and essentially what, they, what the HCM does is it, it says, is it a two, a four, or six-lane roadway? And then it also, it provides kind of a volume that's allowed for each of those level of services and it has um, two other variables that are considered, um, well, three other, there's speed, whether or not the roadway is um, uh, under 45 miles an hour or um, essentially 30 to 45 miles an hour or 45 miles per hour or more. And then there's a K and a D factor. Um, the K factor is the proportion of daily volume that's assumed to uh, be carried during the uh, peak hour, and then the D factor is the percentage of vehicles that are going in one direction versus the other. So it's it's very generalized. I would say it gives you no turnout lanes credit or no, anything. No, no, it that's does not. Okay. That is correct. Okay. Uh, coming back to the question, I am for the principal and minor arterials, which I think is what were required by the GMA. Although from my earlier question, we're already covered by intersections anyhow. Right. But I think if we're gonna use something, I think it should be kind of in conformity with the GMA for principal and minor arterials. No, we can't make a motion. No, no, no. Uh, I, I am. I'm I like it. So, <laughs> what, so like what, that would, so. what that quantifies is the red and the green on the map on the screen now. It's principal and minor. 228 Sahali, East Lakes Finish Parkway, Principles 32nd, no, he was talking about Issaquah Pine, Issaquah oh, Fall, oh, and Inglewood Hill slash Northeast 8th, and then 244th to Southeast 8th. I can't stop Red and green. And your recent right. Right. Okay, we're gonna go with Mayor Melchow followed by Councilmember Ross. Oh, red and blue, my bad. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> red, red and blue. Yeah, I must, red I must, I must be. <laughs> red and blue. Okay. So just the red and blue? No. Just the, the red and blue are, your, are, are our principal and minor arterials. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to add my voice in so that, that was the direction that I wanted to go was principal and minor arterials only, so. What was that? I'm sorry. She wants, she wants principal and minor arterials. Okay. Right, cause... Reasonable to you. Councilmember Ross, followed by Councilmember Stewart. Okay, I support principal and minor arterials. 
and I want to see if you can confirm an observation on F dot versus, versus HCM. If we start adding features such as signalization medians or turn lanes, the, cap the uh, capacity will increase for the, for the F dot. And I think what we're seeing here is those uh, instances where the segment has a higher F dot versus HCM is they do have any or all those features. Is that fair to say? I, I would say your your statement that F dot provides credit for those facilities and it increases the capacity in recognition of those facilities is absolutely right. Um, I'd have to do a comparison um, on the second piece of the statement, but in terms of HCM is completely insensitive to those in terms of the table that I'm showing you, the, the table 1616. Um, whereas it, it just makes some generalized assumptions of whether those exist or not, whereas F dot does actually let you explicitly include or take out. Thank you. Council Member Stewart. Yeah, so um, in previous discussions, we talked about uh, excluding East Lake Sammamish Parkway, so I'm in favor of principal and minor arterials, but not necessarily including uh, the East Lake Sammamish Parkway, uh, just as we've discussed uh, previously and voted on. Okay, and uh, Councilmember Valderrama. Yeah, I would be in favor of the only looking at the principles, but not including East Lake Sammamish uh, Parkway on it, and since we had been done excluding it from the analysis and had talked to some degree of basically accepting a level of service on that eve, I guess we would vote on later at another date if we got to that point. Uh, but at least what you just at right now, excluding it. What wouldn't be a letter. Clar clarify what you just said. I didn't understand it what you said. It wouldn't be a letter. Oh, it wouldn't be a letter. Sorry. A different number. Yeah. Uh, okay. A different number at, uh, at a later date that we would be doing that discussion. Uh, at this point in time, I would also be looking at if we're going to choose between the highway capacity manual and the F dot, I'd be more in favor of the highway capacity manual. That's what we have kept raising. There was a lot of disparaging and criticism of the Florida model earlier on. It looks like it would be a cheaper and easier way to go. And given that we had heard last week that there's very little value being brought anyways from the capacity analysis. Uh, I think we should make it as cheap and as quick as possible. I think that coincides with Deputy Mayor Moran's wishes to have a quick solution to uh, produce the results as well. Thank you. Council Member Ross, then Council Member Ritchie. Oh, okay, Council Member Ritchie. Um, I support um, principal and minor arterials, and I support getting data from East Lake Sammamish Parkway, and I support the idea that we can apply a number to it that would allow us to essentially exempt it, mm -hmm. to remove it from, because we can't do anything to it. Yeah. So I don't have a problem with it being in there. Um, for my purposes, I know that all the traffic that comes down East Lake Spamish Parkway from Redmond is going through that intersection at Inglewood. So we're catching it all anyway. But at the same time, more data is good data. Okay. Let's try and get as much as we can. And we still have the capacity to be able to, to not, I don't want to use the word capacity because we're in a V over C conversation. We still have the ability to, to effectuate some sort of, God, I really don't want to use the word exemption, but to, to utilize it or not, you know, to, to make an effort to try to, to be aware of it. And if the intersection data that we're getting at that East Lake Smash Parkway and Inglewood is not good data, how would we know unless we're actually seeing the segment coming down or the corridor or whatever it's going to be? So I'm in favor of getting as much data as we can, but we're not losing the ability to do something about it as we're going along. So two is better than one. Let's get as much data as we can and let's go from there. And I want to tell you from my standpoint, I, I pretty much, I could echo exactly what was just said, so. Okay, okay next.
Absolutely. You're ready for the next one? All right. So the second one. We have a chance to get out of here as nine as they said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe. <Good question. laughs> Couple more to go. So the segments versus uh, corridor limits. In the 2017 uh, draft plan, we added a few segments and we we kind of redefined some of the, the segments that were in the 2015 uh, comp plan. So our recommendation is to go with whatever the segments that were defined for the principal and minor arterials uh, in the 2017 draft comp plan. Uh, there's a... I thought there was a map. Is that what you can show me? Oh, there. Okay. Map Good. right here shows the segments in tw in the 2017 draft uh, comp plan. Kind of hard to see some of those segments, but it gives you an idea of, of which ones. I'm sorry. Is it between all the dots? Is that what the yes. segments are? Yes. Yes. And again, we're not going to be evaluating all of these roads. It's just the principals and the minors. And then your other, your other decision, <coughs> Where you saw the blue which you don't really gas. need to make that decision tonight, Great. but we are asking that you think about whether you want to have corridors or not. Again, corridors are just made up of, of contiguous segments. I, I don't know. I don't remember the blue and the red. Was it? I thought that was blue. <laughs> Council Member Stewart. So in your question of do we want corridors or just segments, can you just uh, give us a couple of pros and cons for and against having corridors in addition to segments? I mean, it seems like it would add a level of complexity, but what value, I guess, would that add? Yeah, I, I apologize for not including that. The, the segments, if you just go with segments, then as they fail, you will, we will need to put them on the capital, uh, on the tip. You may, we may have a situation where you have a piecemeal uh, section, say along 228th, where one segment fails, the next one doesn't, but the next one does. In reality, whether we would actually make, put a, together a project like that, where you may have two blocks where you, you, the data says, well, you don't need to widen the roadway, but the th three blocks, four blocks on either side, you do, when in reality we would probably make improvements along the whole stretch. And you would be, you, we would have to put those failing segments on our tip. If you had a corridor and you, and we do what's in the 2015 comp plan is we, it's a weighted average. You can, if the whole corridor by the weighted average, if it, if the corridor fails, then you need to improve the whole corridor. You can choose though, to just improve the segments within that corridor if, if we want to. So it just gives you more flexibility if we do uh, have corridors versus just the segments. Council Member Ritchie. Uh, I support the corridor concept because I think that's kind of what we're dealing with right now. I remember Mayor Miranda, or Mayor Miranda, Mayor Malchow and I back, you know, early on when I got on the council, we're talking about how on um, Isquah Falls City, or Isquah Pine Lake Road, there's segments that fail, but the whole road doesn't fail. So I w I'm trying to get away from that. One of the benefits of this idea of a V over C that isn't really answered through intersections is what part of the road is failing, and does that necessarily mean that we should improve all of it if, if a quarter of it is failing and three quarters of it is not? We need to know what that means, but a quarter of it failing if we're just using segments, that kind of pins us in to having to deal with that. Mm -hmm. So I would, I support doing a quarter so we can get much more information because we, a quarter gives us a much larger, you know, more data to work with. And like you just said, we can pull out a segment if it makes good financial sense, good traffic management sense to, you know, to effectuate some sort of infrastructure dollars on that segment then so be it. But I don't want to be stuck into something. I think the weighted averages make sense, but I think a corridor gives us much more information. So I support that. Council Member Ross. Maybe I misheard the explanation on corridor, but I thought that was the weighted average. So, That's what he's saying. He's so effectively, if you had one segment in that corridor that was real poor, and on the average it's good, it passes. And that's, that's what Council Member Ritchie's arguing, that you would like that approach that if one segment is horrible, 
but the rest of them, the average is okay. You're okay with not doing a, any type of improvement. We don't have to, right? We can. We can if it makes good financial sense, you know, right? That, am I right? All right, then, um, Council Member Hornish. Yes, but if you start measuring the corridor, you won't see the segment failures. And for that reason, I think we need to stick with segments because they are pinch points along that corridor. And if they're a pinch point, they need to be dealt with. Say la vie. Um, as far as which segments, I'm with you on the defined 2017 comp plan. Uh, but I think we have a, a different rationale as to why we should use or not use corridors versus segments that I, I think it's a pinch point that should be addressed. So we would be calculating each segment. Uh, that's you me oversee. talking. I, uh, that's not a council but decision. We, we would. <laughs> but we, we would. Oh, you would be calculating, you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, well, I think that gives, uh, see, I think we've, we've punted way too long in the city to not fix things. If it's failing with what we're setting as a policy, depending on what V over C we set as the policy limit, I think it needs to be fixed on a segment by, still think it still needs to be fixed on a segment by segment, but thank you. So maybe I can clarify, I, I realize I probably sort of started hurrying things up and, and, and kind of asking you to do several things at the same time. So, yeah, the, so, the, first, so the first <laughs> one, trying to hit this nine o'clock, we're going steps. down to 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> So the, the first one is, it, it sounds like you're comfortable with using the segments as defined in the 2017 comp plan for ar arterials and minors, okay? And then, so we will, we will give you the calculations for all of those segments. Then the decision is, do you want to, do you want to combine several of the segments together to give you the weighted average for a corridor. So and that's we will not definitely on this give you the decision tree, correct? It's kind of on two. You, you, it's kind of on it, two? It's two well, it segment corridor. slash corridor limits. But it's not over on the right side as far as the decision tree itself. That's why I was kind of answering that question as well as which segments. So it, it's two different questions, it's, I it's think. It's embedded it because you're correct. It is embedded in the 15 and 17 because both of them use the corridors approach. So I, yeah, I, I realize oh, that I probably does use the corridor. It does. Okay. It does. So I should have separated so them out. Okay. If I may, in terms of the segment versus corridor question, um, pros and cons, I think is one of the, the questions that one of the council members asked. Um, a pro of using um, the corridor approach is that it provides the city with more flexibility. So again, on a just we'll make up a, a corridor where you've got four passing segments and one failing segment, um, you know, maybe you've got some, you've got some time. That doesn't mean that you can't address that segment. The city always has the discretion to do that. Um, but if you're using a segment approach, then you must address that segment. On the other hand, um, one of the um, council frustrations that led us to where we are tonight in this entire process was that um, there was a concern that we were kind of washing over um, some of the peaking issues in the city and that the, the corridors approach was allowing us to ignore some of those. Um, so I think it's a, it's a question of infrastructure funding flexibility. If you wanna wait until infrastructure is more affordable or you can better position it, the corridor approach is better. If you're um, wanting to be um, very responsive to peaking issues and addressing those and you want the city to be forced and have a mechanism to address those, um, then you know the segment would force your hand more into addressing those um, uh, peaking issues, congestion issues more immediately. For the segment. But in that regard, if, if a corridor allows a new developer to pass, they wouldn't have to fix it. Whereas if they cause a segment to fail, they would have to fix it to mitigate it to be able to build, correct? If um, segments are a part of your concurrency methodology, that, then yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we've got Council Member Valderrama. Uh, following on that 
Uh, I, I'm for the corridor method just because it gives us more flexibility as a city to look at how we're going to be allocating the costs and that we're not forced immediately to go through, especially with the pressures. We just came out of a discussion with the park and cutting back so we could put the road, so it makes no sense then to immediately say, well, every time a segment comes up and when the, the roadway uh, goes forward. That said, I mean, there was originally the discussions of not liking with the past methodology, the T8 and the segment averaging, but the logic of it comes in. And I go back to, if we had listened to Deputy Mayor Barant, maybe that was the way to go, because we're coming back to the old methodology in the end, except taking T8 out. So uh, walk, speak louder, or carry a bigger stick. So I'm for the corridors, thank you. Okay, Council Member Ross, then Council Member, Council Member Stewart. Going back on the flexibility, I think it's really flexibility versus financing to some degree, and I think Council Member Horn has touched on it. If you have a segment that fails in a corridor and you have the segment as your policy, you may draw some mitigation fees to support the repair or the improvement of that segment. However, if that's that pinch point, as he called it, um, still on the average of the corridor is still okay under the corridor measurement, we have flexibility to do something about it or not. But if we do something about it, we're not gonna get any mitigation fees. Did I summarize that correctly? Um, and I'm trying to understand your mitigation fee. I think Steve yeah. might have something to say there. On impact fees, impact fees, I will say from the perspective of impact fees, actually not having a failing a a segment allows you um, to extract more impact fees. The more failure you have, actually, the more deficiency you have to declare which erodes at the level of impact fees you're able to calculate or collect. So if there's current capacity, we can share that cost by collecting impact fees. If we deem it as currently failing, we have no capacity for growth, so that's where it would not be included in our current TIF. So this is an awkward conversation because Issaquah Pine Lake, as well as you know the work on Sahali are already in our program. So we're kind of looking at Issaquah Pine, for example, as, well, maybe it's got these failures. Well, you're looking under at its current assessment, its current configuration, and the fact that we are currently mitigating it by designing it to repair. So we're not getting to the 2024 look, we're not getting the six year down the road look through this snapshot, because you guys are only seeing current status. So yes, we have some failures that are identified, but please remember everything on here except East Lake Spanish Parkway is already programmed into our TIF. It's already programmed into our TIP. We're not losing any flexibility or any, any resources currently. So I just, I don't wanna worry everybody about you know, what we lose and what is or isn't flexible right now. Because we have a program in place and both East Lake Spanish Parkway uh, is the only one not on it, but Sahali is on it in some fashion. Yes, it's pushed out off the six, but it is currently in the math. And then Issaquah Pine Lake is currently in the six. So we don't need to get scared about losing any, any resources or flexibility to accomplish those repairs. So let me follow up a little. If, if it currently is passing, but new development with their concurrency certificate application pushes it into a failure situation, okay. that would trigger impact fees, would that not? They're gonna pay impact fees no matter no what. No matter what. No but matter it may what. trigger them having to remedy it prior to issuing their certificate to them to develop. Right. More than now, impact. sometimes too, there may be things that their transportation engineers can present to us that may not be the entire capital program for that segment, but get it to pass just enough so it's not failing anymore. Doesn't mean we don't do the capital project eventually, but they can do things to mitigate that level of service failure at that time. And again, it doesn't, I want to be clear, it doesn't need to mean they need to fix it in whole. They need to get it down to be mitigated to an acceptable level of service that our city policy has set. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank okay. you, that's helpful. Okay. That's a good question. Council Member Stewart. All right. So I was just talking about we should keep it simpler, and now I'm gonna propose something that's more complicated. Um, <laughs> but, but I think it addresses all the concerns that I'm hearing. So uh, on the one hand, I like the idea of uh, the corridors, particularly if we use peak hours, uh, because if I think about 
Sahali as a whole, right? If there's only one piece of Sahali, if there's one segment that's failing in Sahali, um, you know, I have concerns about having a failure overall, right? Like I'm thinking about my overall commute, right? My overall commute is what I'm concerned about. If there's one place where it's extra slow, that may not be as big of a problem, right? Um, but I hear uh, the other council members saying, well, wait a minute, we don't want to have a, a segment that could fail, uh, that new development would cause to fail, and then they're not forced to mitigate that. Um, I'm thinking that we could have uh, kind of the best of both worlds and that we could use a corridor with the weighted averaging, uh, but we could have a cap on the segment failure. So if we use the example that uh, we're using peak hour and we set uh, a V over C of, I'm gonna say 1.25, because I'm thinking that during peak hours, we shouldn't expect traffic to flow uh, at the same rate that it would during non-peak hours, right? It's okay during rush hour to be a little bit slower. So we set it at 1.25. We can have a segment fail, uh, but the corridor may pass, but we can have a, a failure rate that says it can't be, a particular segment can't fail by more than, I don't know, I'm gonna throw out a number, 1.4 or 1.35 or something. So it can fail, but if, it, if a single segment fails by more than a certain amount, then that triggers a failure. So it's, it's like an extra safety catch there that says we don't want to be forced into, we want to have that flexibility. We don't want to be forced into something if we feel like we have. Uh, and probably a better example would be if we, we look around some of the schools, right? So if you look at some of your schools where you have the 15 minute problem, right? This segment fails 10 minutes before the bell rings and that's the only time it fails. Do we really want to be forced into doing some sort of major uh, expansion where we're essentially paving over paradise. We're creating more impervious surface. We're having more negative impacts on the environments for something that's probably gonna clear up uh, as you know, two minutes after the bell rings and everybody starts scurrying in so they're not late for homeroom. Um, if, we, if we can put in some other safety net, and again, my, my numbers were just examples, but I think we could kind of find a way to have that safety net to give us the flexibility that we need, uh, but not allow something to go completely haywire. So again, if I were to use the Sahali example, and I would, I'll channel Mayor Malchow, and she says, well, wait a minute, I'm not okay with a corridor weighted average on Sahali because there's the light at 37th that drives me nuts. Um, we could say, you know, the overall corridor can continue to pass even if that one segment fails. However, if that one segment fails by more than a certain amount, it's gonna cause the corridor to fail. So I, I think we can look at some of the math um, and I know that this is adding a huge level of complexity, and so Cheryl and Kendra are probably gonna catch me in the parking lot later. Um, but I'm just feeling like uh, there's a way to be able to um, make sure that we're not giving any developers a pass, but at the same time, we're not painting ourselves into a corner that because of a school, we've got a 15 minute problem that's gonna cause us to go spend a whole lot of money and do something to the environment that we really didn't wanna have to do. So it's just, just a thought, I'm just kind of throwing it out there. I'll leave it to the experts to say whether this is just adding a level of co complexity that doesn't need to be there. Maybe that can be uh, accounted for in how we do the weighted averaging and maybe that's where the weighting comes in and that's how you put in that extra safety net. But anyway, just a thought. Um, I want to check, Chris, uh, Mayor Melchow, are you still with us? I am, yeah, and I'd love to be able to speak if there's a chance. Uh, do you have any, do you have something you'd like to add? I do, yeah. So um, first on Council Member Stewart's idea, I'd like to find out if that's something that we can even do. Um, so if staff could maybe comment on that first and then I wanna circle back on segments versus corridors. <laughs> Short story is yes, um, we can do it. I mean, there's, I think the only thing I would caution Council with this approach, I think I think it's a sound one. I mean, logically, I'm following it pretty well. Um, it's more um, policy decisions that you're going to have to make because not only are you going to have to figure out what segment level is acceptable to you, but then you have to figure out that upper limit as well. So that's from the perspective of an Excel formula, and can we build that in? Absolutely. And okay, and where uh, each segment within that corridor should have a different. V over C cap as well. 
Well, I don't want to make it too complex. I generally speaking like the idea if we're going to go the corridor route because I want to go back to a non-school related problem that we've had in the past on segment averaging, which is Issaquah Pine Lake Road, where this, the first segment, which is near the QFC, has far more capacity than after you get past the roundabout at 32nd. And that's why Issaquah Pine Lake Road was a perpetual, you know, static uh, project on our tip that never was done because it was never the whole corridor wasn't failing and so we allowed it to sit there and then if you go and you look at the v over c ratios um, now you can actually see just how ugly it is <laughs> out there on Isco pine lake road because pre previous councils allowed for this um, way of calculating whether or not we were going to allow a corridor to fail so I, I have some hesitation on the corridor unless there's some logical mechanism that like council member Stewart had, um, had said. I don't wanna make it too complex though. And then relative to Issaquah Pine Lake Road, you know, I really doubt that we are going to find ourselves doing Issaquah Fall City Road phase one, then turn to phase two, and then turn our attention to Issaquah Pine Lake Road. I stand here now and say there's no way we're going to do Esquipine Pine Lake Road in six years. I know it's on the tip. It's not going to happen. I guarantee you we're going to have to go up north and do something on, on Sahali before we circle back. So I'm just putting it out there to keep in mind of where things are at in their current state or when they're likely to be actually done. Did you have any other questions? Nope. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, Council Member Hornish. I like Council Member Stewart's idea. Okay, hold on. <laughs> wait, wait. <laughs> Another wait, round of drinks. <laughs> Could you repeat that for the record? Yes, <laughs> I know, okay. <laughs> I appreciate it. Now, to simplify it, I would propose instead of trying to set individual segments inside the corridor is just to say, but no one segment can fail more than X percent above whatever that segment max is, yep. like 10, 20, or, that, or whatever. So that way, if it's high, it somewhat simplifies the embedded boot do loop is how I'm looking at it. It's, it's an if this, then that, and then if this, then that. But it makes it a little easier to co code in my mind to say, hey, it can't be more than 20% of whatever that number is. So, or, or whatever, I don't wanna use 20%, but some percentage number, so. Right, as, as Kendra mentioned, the spreadsheet is actually the easy part. It's, yeah, it's, yeah giving us the numbers to put in the spreadsheet. Well, but all we have to do is then decide what is the maximum V over C period for that segment. You guys can run the corridor calculations and then you know if it goes over X percent of that corridor that we set as a policy and we have to set that percentage as a policy too. That's right. It, it's a spread, it's easy to calculate, mm -hmm. so. And not to caution it, but just know if a, if a segment in the middle of a corridor fails, we're gonna have to build from whatever has full build to that point, right? We're not gonna hopscotch around. So if we have a segment set at $5 million, but the corridor is, you know, whole corridor would be 20, we're gonna need to do half because, you know, where we have four lanes at Sahali, they go to two, well, we're not gonna skip that section. And, That's fair. you know, you're gonna get two lanes to four and then you're gonna have lane restriction weaving going on and, and combining that's gonna make it worse. So we will have to, you know, logically think about how we package the failure mitigations, but just know, yes, one segment's gonna fail, we're gonna have to go back one or two in whole to construct them so that we have a reasonable project okay. to I'm come okay out of it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Probably could have said that better with a picture, but. I got it. <laughs> Do we have anything that tells us um, how many segments in a, a corridor we allow to fail before we have to look at the or corridor? Changes. I mean, is it two segments that are allowed to that fail and then you have to look at the whole corridor? Or I mean, what is it three? Is it? It's, yeah. it's, it's currently volume weighted average. Mm -hmm. um, so again, you know, not to add additional complexity, as I'm understanding uh, Council Member Stewart's um, suggestion here is that, you know, we'd be looking at the corridors, potentially the 2017, um, uh, draft comp plan corridors, 
Um, and then also saying that a segment cannot, you know, it's also, it's a, it's a failure if the quarter goes over this volume weighted average or um, certain segments can't reach, you know, beyond a certain percentage over that. Um, you could also do it by based on the number of segments that are failing within a quarter, although I would caution you that there are different numbers of segments in each of the quarters. Um, so that's probably a more arbitrary um, number than just ha setting a, 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 you know, a fail by limit for individual segments. Do we have any of your questions? Okay. All right. Councilmember Ross actually has one. Not, not a question. I just want to see. I, I like um, Councilmember Stewart's proposal as amended with the percentage basis to keep it simple and easy to monitor, manage. All right. So the next one is the uh, time period. So based on lots of discussions that we've had with Council so far, uh, you've landed on the AM. PM peak hours Tuesday through Thursday. I'd like to just confirm that that's the direction that continues to be the direction instead of uh, daily Tuesday through Thursday. So we can read that back AM, PM, AM, PM is peak hours Tuesday through Thursday. I'm sorry, what was it? Is that AM or PM? AM it's the peak. AM or PM yes, peak, peak hours. Tuesday through Thursday. I see lots of nodding of heads. Okay. Yes. Then the the fourth one, again, the council has has directed its staff so far to look at the one way instead of the two way. As Kendra mentioned, if you if you want to go back to the two way, you can pick any of the four methods. If you want to go directional, again, then we're narrowing it down to the 8 CM or the F dot. I, I'm actually gonna amend that a little bit, Cheryl. If we're down to AM and PM peak hour, we've actually, we're not using T8 or modified T8. Right. At that point, we're moving to F dot or HCM as the current level of, uh, the number of options that we provided you with. Okay. Um, but either of those have the ability to do either two way or one way. Council Member Stewart. Yeah, and again, just to clarify, so if we are looking at peak hours only as opposed to the average weighted daily volumes, um, then when we're setting the policy for what the V over C threshold is, I'm assuming that um, we should be considering something likely greater than one. Because again, if I look at V over C, uh, volume over capacity of one means that the road is handling the volume that it was built to, to handle, and that during rush hour, we're gonna assume that we're gonna have a little bit more traffic, and that's okay, like that's expected. That's mm -hmm. the definition of rush hour. So um, I'm fine with that. I guess uh, what I would like to know from you guys is what are some uh, thresholds that are used in varying areas, and what do those really mean, right? So when I think of 1.2, what you know, I'm thinking, does that, you know, adding 20% capacity, does that, what does that really mean? Uh, or is that kind of a standard? Are there industry standards? Are there standards from neighboring cities? Like how can we as a council get uh, a good understanding of what a 1.1 1 1 versus 1.2 versus 1.25 would mean? Perfect. Um, and and we can kind of share that. I, I do know off the top of my head, Bellevue, I think, has a 1.2 standard. Wait. It's actually an intersection VC, so it's a little different, and it's a, over a two-hour period, not just a one-hour period. Um, I, I don't have off the top of my head kind of all the communities that are your neighbors, but I think your comment that peak hour is going to see a higher level of congestion than you would expect over daily is, is a very accurate statement. Um, so I'll leave it there. Um, the one thing I will say is directional versus two-way. Um, if we're uh, as, if we're talking about doing this volume-weighted averaging approach with segments um, and having the stipulation of maximum per segments, it's just we're going to have to work through some of the math and the mechanics of that. Is it's a little different proposal than maybe we had in mind, but definitely something worth looking at. If I can just ask a clarifying question. So when we say one way versus two way, just to make sure I understand what that is, what we're saying is we're gonna look at the AM and PM peak hour, whichever is worse, right? 
Is that correct? And that's what the one way means versus we would look at any given segment and we'd somehow average the volume or can, can you just clarify? We actually look at both. Okay. Um, so what we're doing when we look at two way, obviously, is you say, okay, how many vehicles are traveling on this segment of roadway and what is a segment of roadways capacity, two way capacity. Um, when you're looking at directional one way or mm -hmm. directional, you can use, you can yep. use either of those terms. It's actually, we're looking at each individual capacity by direction and comparing it to the count of vehicles, but we are actually looking at both. Okay. But that, the one, the directional really kind of focuses in on, you know, on the north end of the city, it's the southbound traffic in the PM that we're really focusing on. And we're not right. giving any credit for, you know, maybe as you're sitting in traffic and you're noticing that the other lane is completely empty. We're not, we're not. That is correct. Taking, it's so it's really, it's really being a lot more precise in some ways. Uh, whereas other areas that may use the the bi-directional or the two-way uh, that look at that are being less precise and again, maybe why they have a lower threshold because they're really looking at both of those directions. That is correct. They're okay. not as focused on kind of the peaking conditions. Okay. Thank I just you. want to say this. I agree again. <laughs> can, wait, can we, can we just, <laughs> for the record. <laughs> Uh, Council Member Ross. Yeah, I want to follow up on the um, peak AM peak, AM PM peak. When we talked about bumping it up, say 0.2 for the capacity, but doesn't the capacity calculation already take into account and we're effectively double adjusting it? Because you're already adjusting it when you do the capacity calculation using AM PM. It's all already higher. It's already, a, so what am I? Higher. Of course, the volume's higher, but you have a higher capacity calculated with the um, the AMP um, um, peak calculation using the different models. So I'm, I'm a little confused. It feels like we're adjusting it twice, once the model does it, and then secondly, <laughs> we're bumping up 0 0.2. Well, let me give let me give an example of, you know, and I think for any of your really peaked arterials, um, you have quite a few more people traveling in, in you know, the, the prevailing commute direction. So let's talk about the morning. Um, you have on Sahali Way a lot more people traveling north in the morning than you have south. And when you're doing a directional assessment, what it's going to compare is those two, one or two lanes that are heading north. Um, what are their capacity versus the number of people that are using it versus... Um, uh, rather than if you're doing the two-way, you're actually adding up the full capacity of the roadway and you're, you're adding up all the vehicles that are using it during that time period. And of course, the, the flow is very unbalanced. So by doing a directional, you're really, you're doing, I'd say the, the maximum, maybe we'll call it the stress test. It's the, the ultimate stress test of your system. Um, again, at the same time, if you're using that as a metric, you want to be very, very careful about what VC do you put in place in terms of what's acceptable. Because you certainly don't want to, to use an analogy we've used here in council before, um, build your system like you would build a, a, a shopping mall parking lot for um, you know Christmas Eve night. Obviously, you know we we want to be careful with with taxpayer dollars, making sure that we're optimizing our system. Addressing those congestion issues where we can, but not overbuilding it to the extent where we're throwing all of our money into building roads. Thank you. Were you asking, um, Councilman Ross, were you asking if the capacity was bumped up during the peak hours during the calculations and that's why you felt like it was double crediting? Is that what you were asking? So I just want to make sure I understand what you were asking and if we, we got well, a clarification. I think what, what I was asking is we all, it already bumps up the capacity using the calculation, um, but I think the answer is withstand, notwithstanding that, if you have congestion that's already over, we may consider a policy to increase it to accommodate an unusual congestion. Well, I just want to area. clarify, we don't bump up capacity, so however we determine. The V over C ratio, rather. Okay, I was gonna say, because capacity is a fixed it, number. It, it, okay. It's calculated, yes, okay. it's, it's fixed number calculated. I'm just saying the okay. VOC ratio is the second calculation. The first is calculating the C from the model. Okay, any other questions? 
moving forward. I, so, well, so let me summarize what I think I heard. Okay. Princi what? Easy one. Principal and minors are only. We'll use the segments uh, as, as defined in the 2017 draft comp plan. And, and then we will show you the numbers for segments, or I'm sorry, for corridors as well. But we will definitely show you the segments and then we'll show you the, the results for the corridors. AM and PM peak hours, one way. The method, uh, HCM versus F dot, we can, we'll bring back the numbers for both of those methods, unless, unless you're ready to, to give us direction on which method you like. Because that method will determine your capacity. And then we will come back and you'll decide on what the what the V over C LOS threshold is. Council Member Ritchie? Uh, I'd support HCM. Karen, I'll weigh in here if you don't know other lights on. Council Member or Mayor Mayor Melchow? I like the F dot actually. And I, I would caution my fellow council members by being scared because there's bigger ratios over there. We have that is completely in our purview um, to accept or not accept certain numbers. So just because it's over 1.0 doesn't have to define a failure. She likes F. She likes F. Dot. F dot. Even though it gives you bigger numbers. Or, yeah. Okay. Or smaller, actually smaller capacities, right? Okay. Bigger V over C. So. Well, I think it's, it's more it's more comprehensive. But what I, in case my what I said didn't quite come through, is that I I don't want the decision on HDM versus F dot to be driven by the ratios that they produced, because we have it within our purview as council to decide what we accept as that V over C. So it shouldn't be driven by a number on the ratio. It should be driven by the data it is giving us. Okay, so uh, then we will go to Council Member Ross, then Council Member Stewart. Okay. So I just, before we ask staff to do calculations here, I just want to understand because I thought that F dot was out. So why is F dot now okay? I just want to understand that. Do you want me to answer that? F dot. Sure. Oh, I mean, not from you guys, not from staff, but from other council members. I mean, we were, we were, I'll like explain. a hair's breadth away from adopting <laughs> segments on a couple uh, of roads, and then we said, no, F dot is all wrong. We can't do F dot. So I just want to understand why F dot's now okay. I think in a previous council meeting, we had this very same conversation, and Kendra explained that you can't use the other methodology. That this is it. Right, she said we couldn't, but it, okay, I guess I, I'm still confused, but. Uh, actually, I seem to remember you asking specifically, would anybody that was against the FDOT reconsider it for this meeting? And I think the answer was yes, let's bring it back and have a further discussion on FDOT. But I just want to understand why it's now okay. And maybe we talked about it, but can we, because I just still didn't get the sense that most of the council members that didn't like it before that we had, well, you explained why we couldn't use the other, I forget what it was, the non-generalized or whatever, but no. I, I just don't know why this is suddenly okay when Asking it's specific. that, basically? <laughs> well, even, even you, Council Member Hornish, had said specifically that, you know, you read quotes saying we can't use the generalized, it's not supposed to be for these purposes. So I just want to understand why we were so vehemently against it a, a few weeks ago, and now it's okay because I just don't want to go down a path where we ask for information and then we say, oh, well, we can't use that anyway because it's not intended for this purpose. For, for me, it's the, under that table one that they produced in the memo with the considered roadway characteristics. There are far more characteristics that SDOT is considering in producing a capacity of the roadway over the HCM. But how does that solve the, it's never supposed to be used for this purpose that you guys brought up before? If, if I may, I'll, I'll jump in here. I think, you know, a council has just been 
asking questions to make sure that it is the appropriate methodology. My understanding, you know, is that, you know, I've kind of come back and reported, I've gone back, talked to some of our experts around the company, said, are there other methodologies that are more appropriate? And I think, you know, council was wondering, should we be using the conceptual methodology? Should we be using the operations methodology? And I would say that for processes that are further down the line where you're identifying actual treatments that you want to put in place, the length of those treatments, signal timings, all of those, um, I think those those more detailed methodologies, which include simulation, are very appropriate. But I think it, through these discussions, at least my tracking of kind of the council tenor is that this F dot generalized methodology from a concurrency standpoint maybe is the appropriate methodology. That's what I would personally recommend. recommend. Um, but then the further question from council and why we uh, why I see that we arrived here tonight was to ask, well, how does F dot compare to some of these other methodologies? Um, how does it compare to what the HCM might recommend? How does it compare to table T8 or a modified table T8, um, things that the city has seen in the past? Um, and I'm hoping through kind of the results we've able, been able to share tonight is that FDOT isn't, you know, an outlier methodology. Um, it's very comparable and it meets a number of council objectives in terms of being um, better tied to the roadway characteristics that are on the road, um, as well as um, being able to test peak direction um, or even um, uh, or peak hour or peak directionality um, to a greater extent than um, table T8 and some other methodologies that have been problematic. And it is well documented as well. Uh, Councilmember Valderrama. Yeah, no, I appreciate staff's uh, recommendation, and that was recommended. What was it a month ago? And <laughs> you gave it to us originally. It was then trashed and thrown out, and we couldn't get a motion onto. It. Frankly, I was surprised, and and I've had people mock that it was even up for reconsideration now. As we came forward and looking at the volume for capacity, I thought that the, what we were trying to do and this uh, came from Deputy Mayor Moran, was try to find a quick analysis table looking at volume over capacity that we can get done. I thought the highway capacity manual from seeing it will be a lot faster to address. Remember, we've been told from transportation engineers that there is very little value that's gonna be added to the volume to capacity analysis above what we have of the level of services. So. I go back to what Council Member Moran says more and more of what's the quick way to get this done and put in. It's, it's the highway capacity manual. I thought a half hour ago we were gonna get out of here at nine. Now we've gone back to segment averaging. We're revisiting the, the Florida model. It seems like every time I turn around, we're just constantly revisiting things. Let's stick with what we've raised every week of how the highway capacity manual, it looks a lot easier to get it done. And we've already been talking about the numbers that we can play with the V over C to accommodate the will of the council on a policy as far as the- Point uh, of order, principles. please. So. I'd like to stay focused on the question at hand and not that's what I'm trying to do. Going after pri to prior decisions and motives? No, we're coming right now. What I'm saying is let's stay on the V over C, getting something quick, highway capacity mail, work with the capacity as we've just agreed to. Uh, let's go back to where we were a half hour ago. Okay. Take a deep breath, everybody. It is 925. <sighs> deep breath. Right. Council member uh, Richie. Thank you. Um, so it's, sorry, just to direct this towards staff. Um, it, it's pretty clear to me that we don't know which one we wanna deal with. And I think this, count, this conversation kind of originated with Cheryl asking, do we have direction we can give them right now in a study session? And it looks to me like that we don't specifically. So I think Cheryl mentioned that they would be able to run both and we were trying to figure out if it makes sense for them to run both and do we have consensus and we don't. So given the time, given this is a study session, given you know that their capacity to be able to do these things going forward, 
I think it makes sense for staff to do both the F dot and the HCM. Let's see how it all pans out, and then let's go from there. There's no reason to kind of rehash and talk about what happened before. I get it, you know, but I, I think at this point we need to give them some direction, and we're not clear as a council. There's no specificity. There's no unanimity. There isn't even a plurality. So I think we should ask them to give us more data and go from there. Okay, so uh, Council Member Hornish. Well said, I like that. Uh, I'm indifferent between the two, because I think the real thing that we get to set as policy is what is the V over C uh, top number? And, and I don't care if that ratio is 1.2 or 1.9, depending on what number you're using as the bottom C for the V over C, uh, it, which comes from which method. So I'm agnostic as to which method, but I like the idea of maybe looking at both going forward. Okay. We will do our best to crunch as many segments as we can by the 16th. We may not be able to get all of them, okay. but we will do our best. So we'll, you know, we'll focus on the, the principal arterials and then branch out into the minors. I eventually we'll get all the numbers, but we committed to bring, bringing some numbers back to you on the 16th. Well, but, but to be fair to my point, I mean, I just heard Councilmember Ritchie say, uh, we only need a couple to see. We have the couple to see that you gave us tonight already. We see, we see that the HCM may show a 1.2 and the dot may show a 1.7. But my point is if we can set it at whatever we want, it doesn't matter what the ratio is and how we got to the C, mm -hmm. it's just, what method are we comfortable with? And I'm kind of, I really kind of like the F dot because it has more things, but I like the HCM because it's very simple too. So like I say, I'm agnostic. Okay, and in I'm reality, the, and I'll speak for Kendra, but the calculations for HCM and F dot are essentially the same. The, the amount of time to do either one, it, once you, it's Once really you build one, a, you, yeah, right. okay. Okay, so I'm gonna state my opinion just because I haven't gotten to in this. I am sticking with HCM. I do not and haven't from the beginning a few weeks ago understood what our roads have to do with flatlands and Everglades or slopes and landslides. So on the, um, the highway capacity manual. <laughs> I'm with you. So that's the majority. Okay, so that being said, is there any other direction you need from us? No, but I, if, if, you'll, if you will uh, humor me, I just want to go again, go over exactly what we heard. So principals and minors, <coughs> the segments as defined in the 2017 comp plan, segments and corridors, sorry, AM, PM, one way, and HCM, F dot. We will bring back as much data as we can by the 16th. AM, PM, Tuesday, Thursday. Tuesday through Thursday, direct one way, HCM and F dot. Correct, council member. And, and you know you'll see the ca the capacities and the and the resulting V over C. So the three decisions that we have yet to make are between F dot and HCM. What's the max V over C, and what's the max V over C for a segment if we add that into the corridor testing? Those That's are correct. the only three things we have to yet decide. Then right? That's correct. Mayor Melchild, did you have any other questions? Nope, I'm good. Are you resting comfortably? <laughs> I'm resting uncomfortably. <laughs> <laughs> Move to adjourn, or we don't make any motions. Let's go home. Okay, yep. we're done. <laughs>